Kids get to be in order. <coughs> and um, tonight we have on our agenda, we do have a couple presentations uh, that our CFO, Ms. Dow, is going to lead us through with the, um, we have guests, Mr. Huggins and Mr. Dale Genap from uh, Genap uh, Consulting Company. And we'll <coughs> get started. And then we have some capital, a uh, capital update. <coughs> All those in favor? Right here. Um, also, oh, I forgot one thing. Ms. Sprowski is was unable to join us tonight, and actually, I did just again. Um, I just do want to take. I try to remember to take a minute. I know we all come here from different walks of life, busy days, to just quickly read the mission of the Reading Public Schools. Reading Public Schools strives to ensure that all students will have common, challenging, meaningful learning experiences in academics health and wellness, the arts, community service, co-curricular activities, and athletics. We'll lead and manage our school community to reflect the values and cultures of the Reading community and guide and support our students to develop the appropriate skills, strategies, creativity, and knowledge necessary to be productive, informed, independent citizens in a global society. We have reports. Our student Mora is not here tonight. Um, so, do we have any reports from uh, we do. staff? We do. Back, sorry. So, I will just give a brief one and then the rest of it will be covered in the other agenda items. I did want to make sure that all members of the committee knew that the Finance Committee on March 13th did finish its review of the town and school budgets as well as all of the various warrant articles. Um, I know that several of the school committee members were present, so thank you for attending that. But the school committee's recommended budget was approved unanimously by the members of finance committee. The town manager's budget was also approved, and within that was the $300,000 reallocation within accommodated costs to increase the amount of out of district tuition, so that is getting moved forward to town meeting as well. The capital plan was also <coughs> approved, and within that was the proposed funding for Turf 2 was moved forward, as well as the town meeting warrant that would ask the town to allow the schools in the town to enter into IT backup system renewals for a length of time greater than three years, not to exceed six years. So all of the items we've talked about all did get approved unanimously through the Finance Committee. As we mentioned before, once town meeting approves the budget, we will bring it all back to the members of school committee for the school committee to give its final approval once we know what all the numbers are. Thank you. Any other reports? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Um, <clears throat> so last Friday we had our Reading Institute Spring, um, which we concentrated on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we're proud to host uh, just our internal staff this year, um, about 550 staff as well as other community members. Um, our keynote speaker was Dina Simmons <coughs> out of the Yale Center for Emotional T Intelligence, and she was excellent. We had 43 workshops led by regional and national experts, including uh, great Medco representation from Bedford, Lincoln, Foxborough, Walpole, uh, as well as Medco headquarters. Um, Jason Cross did a mini keynote, which was phenomenal, I hear. Uh, I unfortunately did missed it, but we taped it. So our CTV was kind enough to tape a few things. We had a lot of local support. We invited members like uh, Reading Embraces Diversity and Understanding Disabilities to come and speak and lead uh, workshops. We also had staff-led groups from um, the English department, Audra Williams, Zach Broken Rope, Leah Richardson, our special ed department chairs at the high school, Melissa Forbes, Adam Blaustein, uh, as well as uh, Julia Hendricks 
and Jason Cross led a workshop on interrupting racism. Kate Boyton, uh, who's here today, principal of the high school, led um, a case study group. And we also had quite a lot of student groups, which was very exciting. We had the AWOD team from the middle school and the high school that led teachers through some really great conversations. Uh, we had uh, some student groups uh, representing our Gay Straight Alliance, uh, as well as what it means to be Jewish in Reading. We also had uh, a very well-received uh, Lisa <coughs> and Sammy Gibbs did a mother-daughter team, a story of inclusion. So it was a really all-around great day. I um, want to thank all of um, the support from Central Office and from the greater Reading community on putting it together, uh, as well as some uh, generous donations from Ref and O'Connor Studios. So it was, I think, very, very uh, well received. Linda, th Linda was there all day, so thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I came for the keynote, and I really oh, enjoyed. Oh, that's I didn't see you. I'm sorry, yeah, Doctor. Sat in the back, but <laughs> yeah, she was but, powerful. Yeah, she right? was an amazing oh, speaker. She was. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so lots we were of takeaways. Yeah, lots of takeaways. Was that also taped or just? Uh, no, we like couldn't tape. Couldn't yeah, no, to. no. She's nationally. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, on. Like she did a TED talk. <laughs> she she went to like Obama's inauguration. Like yeah, no, we couldn't tape that. So, but she's amazing. We'll, hopefully, we'll meet her again. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to. I have a couple other talking points. Please, okay. Continue. So the second one, we just found out from the state uh, that we were approved for a highly high quality instruction summer planning grant, which was highly competitive. Um, the, actually, the state responded by saying, thank you for submitting such a thoughtful and ambitious proposal. Wow. So uh, we, it's only $5,000, a little over $5,000, but it's for instructional planning time. We earmarked it for middle school math. Um, so we are we already have established a middle school math curriculum subcommittee, which will be meeting through the summer, and we will also create a middle school math curriculum council um, that will be made up of classroom teachers, special ed teachers, ELL teachers, if, if we can have them, building administrators and district administrators. And a huge shout out to um, Heather Leonard, who uh, wrote the grant, applied for the grant, and received the grant. It was really competitive. We, we thought it was a long shot. So every dollar we get that we can work on um, curriculum work, we're, we're seeking that aggressively. That's outstanding. Thank you. Thank That's you. really outstanding. And then my third bullet, okay. sorry, I know I have a lot tonight, uh, is this Saturday we are hosting, once again, Parent University. I took the liberty of printing out some packets of the great day. Um, it's from 8 to 12.30 right here at the high school. Our keynote speaker is Shauna Timoney, who just uh, wrote a book called Creating Compassionate Kids. Uh, this year we tried to focus all of our workshops, there are 17 different workshops, all on raising healthy and happy students um, and children. So it's all about, like, how do you get them there? So it's everything from um, learning about vaping to mental health to mindfulness, to parenting. Um, Therese Wigan, Wiggins is gonna be doing some work on parenting. Uh, emotional support, looking at screen time. It's gonna be a great day. I know Saturday's weather is looking really nice, but I would love to have Reading parents come out. This is a great opportunity. It's open to anyone and everyone. Um, I know last year there were teachers that came. Um, we, we are having Julia and um, Hendrix and Jason are doing a powerful um, talk on interrupting racism that day as well. So please come out, invite your friends. Somebody emailed us and said, can somebody from another community come? And the answer is yes, yes, and more yes. So um, it's all about educating folks from around town um, and really having a time for parents to talk about issues that are important to them. We had a nice committee of parents that helped us plan this this year that we've been meeting with, and a huge shout out to Sandy um, Candrella. Did, did I say Calandrella. that? Calandrella. Calandrella, I always say her name wrong. Calandrella, who has uh, worked really hard at getting this organized. She does a great job. And um, we wanna thank our sponsors for that day, which is the Reading Cooperative Bank and the Reading Education Foundation, so. So, um, yeah. What time does the key, is the keynote first? The keynote note is, I think, at 8.30, yeah. Thank you. Does it say that in the packet now? No. no. Can I? Yeah. Our, Mr. Robinson. Is this just for, is this just, excuse me, is this just for <coughs> parents or can students attend as well? So uh, I would say the topics are more geared to older high school students. Like if they wanted to come, sure, certainly. We are offering a free babysitting that day at the field house. So if you wanted to drop off your kids, um, you just have to let them know because they have to plan for staffing, so you would have to register. So yeah, I, I, tomorrow, you know, 
get let Sandy know and you can drop your kids off at the field house. If there is some motivated, I know we had um, some of our high school presenters stayed for our March 22nd day and did other workshops <laughs> and they found them really meaningful. So we're, we're happy to host that if, if older students want to come. But I think most of the topics are more geared for um, young adults or adults. Great. So I just want to emphasize, I, yes, so it's the keynote. This starts at 8.30 on Saturday. So it's, it, I think check-in is at 8. <coughs> and I think okay. the keynote is at 8.30. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And I think there's, you'd be hard-pressed to figure out which one of the sessions you'd want to attend. Yeah. Some, uh, workshops you'd want to attend at each session because they look phenomenal. Yeah, the keynote is at 8.40, and it's an hour long. So even if you can come for part of the day, you don't have to come for the whole day. You could come and do one of the workshops. Um, I've been tweeting out like crazy, but it, it, it's on the um, adult um, and community learning page. Um, so please check it out. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Excellent. This is Stu with Hersey. Oh, oh, go ahead. Do you have a question on the on this? I, uh, not yeah. on. So I just had a question for Chris, but that's all right. Go yeah, ahead. Okay. No, I just had one update. We are. Um, beginning the process of submitting documentation to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed for a process, a review process in special education that's called tiered focused monitoring. It was formerly called a coordinated program review. Oh, yeah. So it looks at all of our standards, our practices, our policies. Um, so we'll be engaging in that over the next um, month and a half and then the state will come out next year and do some on-site interviews, their own record reviews. Um, there'll be surveys sent out to every parent um, in the district whose child is on an IEP uh, next year for them to be able to provide input as to what their experience has been like. So I just wanted to let the committee know that. And then a formal report will come out uh, usually within 30 to 60 days after the on-site okay. visit. Uh, we don't have a date yet as to when that will be. They won't make that decision until really the fall. Right, and this is part of a planned periodic review. Every six years, Every six they're years. required by the federal government <coughs> to engage in this monitoring activity. Great. Mr. Robinson, did you? <coughs> yes. So uh, you may not have, have it tonight, but I'm just curious how the civics uh, research is going in terms of training materials so that thank you that's a good question um so we also I think I mentioned at the last school committee meeting that we got a grant for that as well mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna be working with a consultant to look at our middle school curriculum and our high school curriculum and if you followed the news at all eighth grade is now gonna have a civics unit which is brand new to eighth grade mm -hmm. involving a project as well um, and like a lot of things the, um, the materials haven't followed the framework so uh, we're definitely working on that piece we do have a committee together we've met a few times we're trying not to jump into things we're trying to see what um, publishers are coming out with and what there is, is out there um, we're also working at what fits into sixth and seventh grade um, so there's going to be quite a bit of shifting this is a big change and then as far as the high school the consultants going to come in we already do an integrated approach at the high school which is rare most uh, districts don't um, and we do U.S. history with some of the world factored into it. Um, the new frameworks actually highly suggest four years of social studies. Most high schools, ourselves included, offer, uh, require three years. Most of our kids take four years of, of high school social studies. Um, so it's, a, it's really layering of like, if we're doing U.S. history, what's going on in the world during that time? Mm -hmm. We already do a lot of that. So we're going to be working with a consultant um, that we're actually interviewing a couple of consultants right now to use that grant money to actually have them peel apart. I'm calling it a forensic audit of like, this is what our syllabi are. This is what we're doing. How close are we to the new frameworks and mm -hmm. what needs to be tweaked? So that we're heavily working on it, but um, I'm, I'm probably not going to have any major updates until the summer about where we're at. Thank you. Dr. Doherty? Thank you. I have a couple of things. Uh, first, I would like to officially announce that Jennifer Stice will be the new Director of Student Services next year for the Reading Public Schools. Uh, Jennifer uh, will begin on July 1st. However, I know for a fact that she will be attending several different events between now and July 1st as part of her transition and her entry plan into writing. She's working very closely with, with Sharon to attend uh, key events, uh, CPAC meetings. Um, she will be part of the, uh, we do have a vacant position for team chair next year, so she'll be a part of that process. Um, 
and she'll be all attending some of our district leadership team meetings and certainly uh, also meeting with, with parents. So uh, we're very excited about this. You heard her on March 11th. Um, the community also uh, asked questions on March 11th. So uh, we're very excited to have her on board. So wanted to share that good news. Um, also in your packet, there is uh, a memo and information section that really highlights several things that Reading has been a part of or recognized for over the last few months. Um, one of the things that we mentioned during the budget process was that we were going to be sending letters to state legislators regarding circuit breaker reimbursement for the state FY20 budget, uh, really uh, asking f to have that fully funded um, in, according to the law, which is the 75% reimbursement level. The, the current proposed budget by the governor is, uh, I believe, high 60%, like 68%, something like that. Uh, so in your packet are those letters to um, Representative uh, Jones, Representative Hegarty, and State Senator Lewis. Um, also, we will have representation at the uh, April 8th summit the, for educational funding that, that State Senator Lewis is going to be having at Melrose High School in their, in their auditorium. Um, so we will be attending that. Um, and that's, that is related to, to all of this, and we certainly will be talking to him about the circuit breaker reimbursement piece. Uh, other things in the memo include Killam being involved in a research study over the last few years um, uh, with the American Institute for Research and Mass Advocates for Children um, in involving trauma-sensitive schools. Killam has been a part of that um, over the last few years, and that final report is due out soon, and the abstract of the study is, is described in the memo. Also, we were highlighted in the DESE annual report um, the, with some of the activities that were happening in local districts. We were partnering with SEAM on uh, enhancing resource allocation and data use. And so the link is provided in your memo where Reading and other school, local school districts are highlighted. Um, we also uh, were highlighted in the Aspen Institute Commission report, uh, which we also did a press release. Uh, which we released on March 1st, and I believe the press release is also in the packet. Um, and really it focused on the relationship that we have with the Reading Coalition Against Substance <coughs> Abuse in terms of uh, it offering youth mental health first aid to not only our staff, but also to other uh, people in the community that work with children. And so that is all highlighted uh, in the memo as well. So I wanted... I wanted to just mention all those things that Reading has been recognized locally, at the state level, and nationally over the last over the last several months. Thank you, Dr. Berry. Appreciate nice. you putting that um, information together for us and getting the press release out. Can I ask you Dr. Question? Doxer. Yep. So I had in my calendar that that roundtable was on April first. No, it's April it's 8th. It's definitely April 8th? That, yeah, we received That's an invitation. invitation. Yeah, it's April I'd 8th. I'd be very lonely yeah. on Monday. Well, we should be early for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I mean, that's all the staff reports, right? Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Robinson, do you have any updates? Yes, so <clears throat> we, reports? the Recreation uh, Committee met uh, last week and it was a light agenda, but one of the things that was discussed was uh, uh, Reading Lacrosse has, a uh, youth lacrosse has approached the committee about Sunday use of fields. Uh, as everyone knows, there's a, you can't use fields on Sunday until noon. Uh, historically, uh, Reading Pop Warner has had an exception to that rule. So uh, lacrosse, based on their, their participation, just doesn't have enough field time to service all the kids that are signed up. So I told them, hopefully not wrong, that they needed to approach uh, you, Gail uh, so about far that. They, I have not heard from them, but once yeah. they do, we can, yeah. I'll have a conversation with them. So uh, that was one of the things we just, that was really the main thing on the agenda was as I said, we went over the capital plan, but it was a light agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, if I can, is, and I don't know whether you had anything planned, but uh, I'd like to take a moment just to thank 
uh, Mr. Boivin uh, for his service, and, uh, and, and I appreciate, you know, the friendship we've developed, and, and uh, you know, I appreciate your, your intellect and, and pointed questions and participation on the committee, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have, um, I'll just sort of build on that. So tonight we are going to be um, saying goodbye to Mr. Bovin and Dr. Coram, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, Dr. Coram stepping up in these last few weeks. Um, so we'll try to also make a remark as we close the meeting, too. So, um, uh, Dr. Dock, sir? Yep, I have um, a couple, but I, some of them I'm just going to briefly say that over the last month when we, in between our meetings, there has been so much going on in this school district um, that has, that relates to the, um, the mission of the schools from um, the plays at, at the high schools and the high school and the middle school, um, the robockets in the field house. Um, it was unbelievable what all the learning that goes on at all levels in all of those activities from business and advocating and writing and working together and um, problem solving and patience and grit and just everything that our mission is trying to impart. And I'm just very grateful. I wanted to commend the students and the parents and the teachers and the administrators on making those things happen because they take a lot of time and a lot of energy and um, so I just wanted to say thank you for all of that, and I'm doing this real quickly, and thank you for the um, Institute. Um, we also had 10 people go this year to the MECO Advocacy Day at the State House, which was really exciting. We had three families from Boston go with seven families from Reading, and so um, it was really nice. We met with Representative Haggerty, with Senator Lewis, with um, Andres Vargas's office, and Representative Brad Jones, and Dr. Quorum was there as well. Um, and we were able to really impart to them the authentic, the importance of authentic relationships and the need for full funding for the program. Um, in order to enable the transportation that is necessary for our students from Boston to stay and participate in sports, in all these things that have been happening over the last months, mm -hmm. and that true friendships are really <coughs> the way to, and relationships are really the way to combat the hate that we see around us, online and otherwise, and so, um, it was really nice to have a chance to speak with our supportive legislators and thank them for their support. Um, and I just actually came from a meeting at RACASA where we discussed um, the youth risk behavioral survey. I said that wrong. Y R B S. Yes, thank you, but I don't like using acronyms. Youth so risk youth risk behavior Behaviors. surveys. Um, the middle school is done. The high school is coming. It's um, really humbling what um, logistics it takes to make those things happen. And um, our principal, Kate Boynton, has been very involved in testing the technology and making sure that we're coordinated with the Middlesex League this year. And because we are coordinated, we'll get the results earlier, which will make them ours to use and learn from earlier, which is really important. There's a bunch of stuff that's been going on in terms of educating for vaping. Mm -hmm. um, there, was, um, there were workshops at Coolidge that went on, and, um, and there'll be workshops at the Parent University as well. Um, the, um, Erica McNamara has done research, been doing research into CBD, which is a, um, an offshoot of the hemp drug from the marijuana plant, or I said that backwards, um, but without, um, it's not supposed to have psychotropic um, if effects, um, but we're trying to educate ourselves. There's no statement in favor or against at this point, just educated research, trying to find unbiased research to try to educate ourselves. And 
One um, caution that did come out of that is if, if the CBD products are being used, just to make sure that they come from Massachusetts because it's more regulated in Massachusetts and from out of Massachusetts, the percentage of THC might actually be higher. So it's just something to be very aware of when you buy the products. Um, and I think that's, that's most of what we talked about at RICASA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any liaison reports, Mr. Bowman? Dr. Corum? Mm -hmm. Uh, just one other quick report. Um, actually, Dr. Doss, Doxer, myself, and um, Dr. Darty attended the um, first meeting of the ad hoc uh, committee that was set up by the Board of Selectmen um, and to just really had our first meeting, did some brainstorming. Um, it was productive, and that group is working to really review the um, sort of the, the, the mechanisms that we have in our community. Um, a, which right now are A-Track and RED uh, as two groups that um, address, may address issues related to racism and, and hate. And uh, so it was a good, I think, first meeting and Vanessa Alvarado and Barry Berman uh, ran, a, I think, an effective meeting and uh, really appreciate the fact that they had a hard stop on the time too, which was very respectful to everybody who was participating. So that group is, they're gonna set up additional meetings um, and I think there's a deliverable to town meeting for November. So expect that that group will continue over the summer. Can I just add a little? Sure. Um, just another caveat that the group is an open meeting. So anybody <coughs> can come to our meetings. They'll be posted. So you can go onto the town website, I assume, to try to find out when the next meeting is. And we'd love for people to come if they have stories to share or ideas about a human rights organization in town. Thank you. I think that's all the reports. Um, so for new business, we have a capital update <coughs> and the late start. So I'm gonna ask Mrs. Dowd to uh, let us get Great. started. Thank you very much. As we discussed during the previous school committee meetings and during the finance committee meetings, we will be providing updates to the committee. We're looking at mainly a quarterly basis that we will be providing updates. Um, that way we can make some forward progress on each of the significant projects and then come on a regular basis. I do <coughs> want to thank everyone who was able to join us tonight. We have um, Town Manager Bob Lillisher here with us, Joe Huggins, the Director of Facilities, and also this evening, we thought it would be a good meeting to have Dale Geenap from Geenap. I'm going to say this because I know you changed the name of the, the company. Um, Geenap Architects with us tonight. And as we mentioned at the last meeting, this is the firm we have hired to assist us with the elementary plan study. So we thought it would be helpful to have Dale here this evening to walk us through what their approach is where we are and sort of what some of the next steps are. And then we would envision in the most likely June timeframe to have him come back um, to give an update. After we go through the elementary master plan, we will then touch upon turf two and um, the security study. Okay, thank you. Thank you. To give you a, an overall view, our, our charge is to develop a master plan for the elementary schools, which is essentially is to identify one or more options for long-term planning solutions for the elementary schools. The steps that we'll take to do that are essentially a, assessment, I'll go back over these, assessment, evaluation, develop planning options, and ultimately, I'll refer to it incorrectly as recommendations, but to be simple for the moment. So the assessment we've largely done, which means uh, we've obtained plans of the schools uh, from the town, mostly through Joe's office and from the school department. You know, we've been through the schools, you know, to update those because most of them are based on the original construction and a number of changes have been done. And just to understand the overall character of the, of the school, the number of classrooms, et cetera. The next, that, and that has largely been completed. Our next step is really evaluation of the buildings <clears throat> largely um, focused on the capacity or the potential capacity of the school as well as the site. And we know that you know most of your sites are fairly full. 
Um, the capacity of schools, and particularly elementary schools, can be based on a number of things. There are the number of classrooms and potentially the number of kindergarten rooms, but even if you increase the classrooms, it could be that the core facilities are not adequate or at, without doing extensive work. So that is one of the steps that we will be doing next. While that is happening, uh, one of our team is NESDEC, the New England School Development Council. Um, they are a school advisory council, uh, a nonprofit, private business, but their key function is to do enrollment projections for the school. So they look at a number of things from birth rates uh, to housing starts, but also changes in, you know, in development in the town. They look at building permits, also open space and what sites are available for development. And that will be done by district. Um, it's, it's common for many towns, but you in particular, it's uh, the anticipated growth is not necessarily even across town. So to the best that we can, we want to look at it by by district, by school district and the area of the schools so that we can then in the next step during evaluation or planning options is to look at how that growth could be accommodated in one or more buildings. So for that, we'll be looking at the ability of the site to absorb potentially more space, uh, the practicality of adding or expanding to a school or renovation to increase the capacity. And again, we'll look at multiple different elements, whether the core facilities, the cafeteria, uh, gym, you know, the, the shared functions library, also with the classrooms, the general classrooms, and then as well, uh, kindergarten classrooms and, and in some cases a pre-k. Our work is limited to just the five elementary schools. We're not looking at the high school or middle school for this purpose. Um, from that we will develop a number of planning options or strategies that might help to accommodate that growth. Um, and that will be a process back and forth with a number of parties uh, in town and takes us, you know, we have to really get a good situational awareness of the town issues, not just the, you know, the bricks and mortars of the buildings themselves. And then finally, we'll come to, as I said incorrectly, recommendations, but um, usually we identify planning options, and more often than not, it's uh, one or it's more than one advantageous options versus not advantageous options. Um, and not advantageous can be affected by, you know, the impact to the site, not fitting the district growth uh, correctly, um, it may, um, you know, relate to cost, obviously. Um, and then from, from that, we usually end up with, a, with one, as they say, more than one advantageous option. And then we work with you usually to develop a preferred option or, or more than one preferred option. And the reason for that is uh, it, it very frequently depends on many town factors beyond just the school buildings. Um, and there may be fat forces outside of the school project itself that impact what is actually practical, uh, perhaps acquisition of land or whatever the case may be. So it's not really possible uh, for one body or our, our office alone to identify the actual solution. Um, so that's really the steps. We, as I say, we've mostly been through the buildings and have a good understanding of the existing buildings. Uh, NESDEC is working on the enrollment projections, but uh, they will still be in that process for another three weeks or so anyway. Uh, we will start making some, you know, guesses about that and looking at what could be done at the schools. So really during April will be that evaluation period. Um, during May, in the later part of April and into May, we'll be, be looking at the planning options and then during later May and into early June, we'll be trying to identify the advantageous and the not advantageous scenarios for eventually a presentation of one or more preferred options. I'm gonna just start um, and the committee can ask questions. I just have, um, I have two questions. So I know we've had a lot of discussion um, with Dr. Darty and, um, and our, our committee about um, programmatically and programmatic needs and the shift and we spent a lot of our time in the budget season led by uh, Ms. Stewart around um, special education. So if you could just sort of say where does that um, piece factor in in terms of, you know, you can see today um, what's going on programmatically but, you know, our staff have uh, that um, future vision, how that, what part of this process that gets incorporated into. 
Uh, essentially, while we're looking at what the capacity of the schools could be, okay. because if you take sort of, you know, back in the day where it was just classrooms in the common areas, yeah. so as the sped spaces are introduced, that can affect <coughs> the number of, of classrooms and therefore enrollment. So we have to look at that along with whatever other changes there may be in the educational standards. You know, computers, when those came into the schools, had an impact. Uh, so all of those things, it goes into that part where we really look at the potential capacity of the school. Okay. And I have uh, just, um, I like the idea of uh, saying here's the non-advantageous possibilities and, and the advantageous ones. I think that's really, really important because people, you know, will ask, well, why didn't you look at, you know, this option? Why didn't you look at X plus two option? And, um, you know, we have had, uh, we've, we've, We've already looked at this twice um, and ended up with non-advantageous um, options um, that I'm sure you're well aware of. So I appreciate that, um, you know, that methodology. And I think it's important because you learn as much from, you know, those things, and then you can really understand um, the what might be the advantageous options. So appreciate that, Mr. Robinson. So, thank you, Dale. Uh, so as part of your team. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud. Do you have Do you have anybody that does any type of look, a financial analysis of the community and the, basically what our know what our means are uh, and look at our our financials and and so you don't come back and recommend something that's that we're just not going to be able to afford. Um, working with with town officials for that information is part of our week. We're, we don't personally look at say bond capacity and those kinds of things, but. We will, as part of this, develop you know, cost estimates, both construction and anticipated project cost. And then we will talk with the right people with, in, in town to identify you know, whether those are uh, possible or not. And that, that's one of the things, for an example, where I say it's not necessarily a recommendation by us, but, but whether it's an advantageous or a not advantageous. And our work is quite possibly will conclude without a definitive single solution because some of those things will take a while for the town to, to determine as well as voters, et cetera. Thank you. Dr. Doxer. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight. Are you going to be looking also at the requirements of um, like the school building, the Massachusetts School Building Association, where we might be able to be funded when you're looking, when you're coming up with your your option, potential options, but not recommendations. I mean, will you have in mind what, what kinds of things might qualify for support from the state and potentially other sources? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So with the capacity of the schools and the programming and what's necessary, obviously, the MSBA, MSBA standards is sort of forefront. We have done this in the past where there may be options that are considered that would not be eligible for funding, but for some reason is considered. Usually it's more advantageous to do something that is eligible for funding, but that is part of the, the process that goes through. And certainly as we're identifying these options, that would be something we would you know, be recognizing whether it would or would not be eligible for reimbursement. Thank you. Mr. Bobby. Just a, a few questions. So the memo about this update says that the anticipated scope of work will focus on Killam School and how that location factors into possible solutions. You just told us that the focus will be limited to the five elementary school buildings, including that Killam School. Two questions about those two statements together. One is, why, why just the elementary school? And two, what does that first sentence mean? How, is, it, is it looking at the lifetime of the Killam School? Is it focused on, are we gonna maintain five elementary schools? What, uh, help us understand in more detail what, what the, like, the work product would look like at the end of this analysis. Well, what, <clears throat> what we would anticipate is, as a broad summary, is looking at, is identifying for all five sites what is the potential, say, for additions, renovations, new construction, and all of them are considered equal as, as we're going through this process. Um, I think Killam probably incorrectly was, was itemized out there partly because we've done more work there. We're a little bit more familiar at it from the start. 
the site is a little bit less encumbered than some of the others, but it really is looking at all five of those. Um, so the, the really the advantageous, not advantageous, we'll talk about what would happen at all of the five sites, or I should say at each of the five sites. Some may be no work, some may be, you know, more work. Um, and then the backup will identify, you know, what specific has to happen within those buildings to accommodate the programming that would be necessary, say for an increase. Did, Mrs. Dowd, do you want to reply to the second question? So I think just for clarification in the update memo that is in the packet, there is no reference to kill them. The initial, because originally what had gone, that I think that might have been the minutes from the February meeting, was the way it was originally put forth was it was sort of part of yes, the so kill them yeah. discussion. We have framed <laughs> this in how um, town meeting did approve it as an elementary planning study, not <coughs> just a kill them. So analysis. So there, we have been basically branding it as we're looking at the elementary envelope to come up with what the right solution would be with all of the various components. So we moved away from calling it a. Is there an? Up, can I just clarify? Because she's is correct. There, I'm there, wrong. There's a memo in the minutes yes. that's from February seventh. She's yeah. correct. I'm wrong. So just to right. set the record straight. Right. So that's it's, it's closer to the minutes versus so, in the update. What is the problem we're trying to solve for? Is it too many kids in the schools or is it the school's too old? The, the main focus is whether the existing schools can handle the anticipated enrollment. The condition of the schools will be sort of one of the components of that. <coughs> but does I, to be clear, our work is not specifically say an assessment of you know cracked brick or needing flooring replacement it is more focused on the educational program and the capacity yeah. and just to put a little bit one of the updates that will that I'll speak on behalf of facilities so he's far enough away um, one of the other the permanent building committee and Joe can speak to this um, as we go through some of our <coughs> other updates they are actually going building by building throughout the town they have started with the schools they've gone through the elementary schools they're moving into the middle schools where they are actually doing more of the brick and mortar assessment and Joe um, is part of that committee so he will be bringing back their reports and assessments as they complete them to the extent there are any deficiencies found within the building so both are sort of going on and we will be sharing that information with the consultants as well so that when they're looking at it they have a full picture if I, can I, I just want to say I know yep. that um, in terms of why we need this I know dr. Gardner and I have had many conversations and in terms of what what the outlook is in terms of space and it, the combination of enrollment programmatic needs you know and student needs and so um, you know I think that's been the driver and obviously um, you know the, the as we all know the kindergarten you know how we're going to serve um, the needs of the community and desires for full day kindergarten and still maintain half day programs so I think that's definitely um, the the, uh, the building wise the Killam school you know there's that evaluation I think has been underway so the physical plant um, it always seems to me is ends up being in a little bit better condition than than almost we might want to see for MSBA qualification <coughs> but um, so I, I and it might might be beneficial in the future I know dr. Darty had sort of we drafted a memo about this but then um, uh, or started putting together some data but never really put that out it might be helpful because I think it would answer some of your questions Can I ask? mr. Robinson oh. Maybe I, I was under the impression <coughs> that this was an enrollment study and not just an elementary enrollment study because, you know, I don't know how far down the road we are at this point, but I think it's important, I would think it's important to look at the, <coughs> other, the middle and, and high school as well, especially if you're just, when you're looking at our special education programs, they move to those schools, so... I'd want to know how the, the space is there as well. Is that, was that not the case or? This was an elementary planning. Yeah, it's, it's always study. been. It's always been. Talked about. Them. Elementary. I think, I mean, part of the reason that it's been that way though is that, I mean, I think 
first. Right now, we are we have not experienced the space constraints um, on our programs at the middle and high school. We have not. So, um, but we're doing. But we're in the midst of doing it. So maybe I'm just thinking it's it's a good time to right. to do it all. Yeah. I think the the scope was defined. Yeah, the scope's been defined for a while now that it was elementary. And that was devoted town meeting, right? To yeah. allocate right. The, the money for an elementary school study. Right. Space study. Mr. Bobbing. Yeah. How is the billing going to work? So we have a budget right, for that was voted on 207,520. I don't think that's changed. Are, are we being billed as a hourly for this, or is it, is it like at stages where each stage of the work product is has a discrete amount or how, how is that set up it's at stages so we have um, we, we went through the competitive bidding process so we have fee proposals for each of the stages that um, Joe and his team have been monitoring very closely due to the size of it um, Allison Jenkins on the town side reviews all contracts the town manager signs all of the contracts. We are currently trending to be coming in slightly below what the budgeted figure was, so we are very confident that we will come in um, at or below budget. So we are monitoring that, and Joe reviews all of the invoices as they come in to ensure that they match up against how the fee proposal was. And once, when we come to June, we'll be able to give final numbers, but we are very confident that we will be well within the budgeted numbers. It's okay to be under. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to overcommit and under, but we are we are we are trending to be able to come in below that. But again, we're still early on, and you you don't know what you don't know until you see it. So, but we will be able to report back in June where we mm -hmm. ultimately came in. Mr. Bobby. Separate separate question. So going back to this old, admittedly old memo that we have as part of, I think, the capital plan materials we put in the packet. It references um, two options for enrollment study. It says a what it calls a more involved demographic study or a simple set of tenure enrollment projections. Have we elected one or the other of those? So we currently, there, there are, and Dale, definitely correct me if I'm sure. wrong. So there are, there are two different ways. You can do what is more of a simplistic, where you just look historically and sort of add a percentage to it. I will say that um, I've been working very closely with DNAP and their team with NESDEC where we actually have reached out to the assistant town manager. She has been providing them a lot of data and information. They are also reaching out there to various realtors within the town to actually get down to the nitty gritty of what are you seeing exiting, what are you seeing coming in. So that's the more in-depth approach where you're actually looking at what's happening not just globally but within the town itself and that is what we have asked them to do and they actually are digging through plans and talking to realtors to really get an understanding of what the demographics in the town are doing. Can I just ask why we picked that? I mean, my, my natural starting point here is looking at our budget book which has 15 years of enrollment and it's within 1% of the median up and down. Right, and so we do have kind of bigger classes and smaller classes, of course, but our overall enrollment across the whole system, 4,200, is pretty flat. Is, is there, are there considerations with new development that prompted this more in-depth approach, or what was so your thinking? So that is part of it, as we are seeing various developments, as well as where you may see, and again, we wanted somebody to look at it holistic, holistically to say, which if you have an aging population moving out and a younger population moving in, you may not see it today. You may say it, see it three, four, five, six, seven years down the road. And what I, I have always said is I'm not an expert on this, but what I do not want to do is come back here and give you information that the committee then makes a decision to build the wrong school at the wrong size in the wrong section of town. As we did mention, they're also looking at where is some of that growth and development and changing in housing happening such that you're looking at it by district as well, not just holistically, because we may end up with a Birch Meadow issue, but Wood End has, everyone moves out of, and I'm making this, everyone moves out of Wood End, <laughs> and everybody moves into Birch Meadow. So we're actually trying to get much more at that granular level since we were fortunate enough to obtain the funding. We wanted to do the best we could with the funding 
we had available. So that was my rationale for asking them to do that level of analysis. We, years ago, we would do this and look first and foremost at just birth rates, and that seemed to be a pretty good guide. But with the, uh, you know, whatever term you want to use, on onslaught of 40B projects, and then also the development of retirement communities, which seemingly doesn't impact the schools, but in fact, it, it usually does dramatically impact them. So there's a, we um, kind of hearing some of that, you know, <coughs> happening in town. So to look at what there is for development potential and uh, not just birth rates, but the housing starts and what kind of trends and, and looking at the demographics of the housing stock and, you know, the communities uh, or neighborhoods, you know, they, they sort of age and one family leaves and new families start coming in. So it seemed like it was important to start understanding that, particularly where you don't have a, a lot of, you know, land left to say for another school and so on to really understand the long-term impact. Okay, Mr. Bobbin and then Dr. Uh, Boxer. So just to respond, I, I totally agree the rotation in the housing stock is a real, un, it could be a real unknown. I think that's sensible to look at that. I wasn't trying to be critical. I was just really trying to understand. Um, Last question is, what's the shelf life of these types of reports in general for communities that you do work for? So you get a very well-researched analysis. We have to you know, understand it and then react to it as a variety of public boards. How, how long are these studies good for? Well, obviously, it, as long as things stay on the same trend. I mean, but, you know, these things are usually done in, uh, you know, I don't have great statistics, but my own experience has been that, you know, these projects are a 10-year cycle many times. I mean, schools, you know, tend to, from the first conversations, they don't usually happen in a very short time. And so that's part of why looking at available land and other kinds of things and as a development, it's not just development pressures, but, you know, different things in society can change. But I, I'd say these are usually a kind of like a 10-year flow type of thing. Dr. Boxer. I just want to clarify, um, Mr. Boven, your, your question confused me a little bit because this whole time I've been hearing that we're not reducing this just to an enrollment study, aside from the fact that you're doing all the research on uh, the turnover in the town, the 40B, all that stuff, but you've also mentioned looking at our core facilities at the programmatic needs of our kids, which is paramount right now mm -hmm. to how the space is used. So I just want to confirm that I'm not hearing that because I want to hear it, that I'm actually hearing that's part of what this study is, some of the information that this study is going to give us. Correct. So we won't, we won't develop like a very, you know, extremely detailed program, but we absolutely look at, you know, schools and what is the program for, you know, for, most of your schools currently are 400. Um, but, you know, a 500 and larger elementary schools, what are the standards, you know, you know, for not just today's schools, but anticipated for other specialized spaces. Many schools have lost, you know, the music art, you know, rooms. And so, you know, those coming back into the program, there are standards, of course, you know, for total gross square feet per student that provide a guide. Um, so the first, that guideline is sort of maybe the first pass, but then we do have to also look at the, you know, reasonable adaptability of a school to accomplish those things that may require more or less square footage. Can I speak? Yeah. Dr. Boxer. Thank you. Um, the other question that begs asking, we just finished talking about our letter to the legislators about um, the, the funding and the letter states about how beneficial it is to bring our out-of-district kids in district. And so we have a lot of that enrollment that's not here right now. Is there going to be any way with this study, are you going to consider those kids who programmatically have to be outside and what it might take, what space it might take or what conditions it might take to bring some of those kids back? so that um, are they counted amongst? Yes, so essentially we'll start by the best we can looking at the, you know, the enrollment projection by district and we'll recognize that the, you know, they may not be attending there now, but that's kind of the starting point and there may be implications to some changes of that. 
but but absolutely it, it, it does try to start with you know the enrollment or projections for an area and then what the school for that area is able to accommodate and all, mrs stewart did you have a I, I just wanted to comment on that and um yes a very good question linda so it in prior districts where i've worked and we've done these space studies whether it be for a new school or renovations um i've been very involved in contributing information around not only a head count but the types of needs and the relative space that might surround a certain type of population, including those children who perhaps are not currently housed and educated within our schools, but if there was a different type of scenario, they possibly might come back. Right, right. So um, whether that's through we have a structured questionnaire, I don't know that maybe gets out some firms yeah, use so that. One of the items which um, we did not state at the beginning, so just a good reminder, as part of what we've done, we have received I'll call them the floor plans, the school plans. So um, Joe has been working with each of the principals, so we are sending these back out to the schools to have them help verify and identify, do we have the space labeled correctly? Are there any other items? So the next step is going to be actually, to the extent we need additional walkthroughs and conversations with the building principals, including the team chairs, is to really go through and look at space and constraints need so that's sort of the evolution of going through this as we've identified it and then i believe though all of those are getting sent out to right. each of the buildings as well to work with we we're trying to do some of the walkthroughs initially without being too intrusive into the classrooms themselves so as a, at the um meeting we had on tuesday joe did walk the principals through where we're at okay. and sort of phase the next phase is we're sending out all of the information to the principals to now have them validate. We just didn't want it to take too much of their time and have them do all of every walkthrough with us. So that is definitely a valid point and it is part of what we're doing. Terrific. So and can I just say, so Mrs. Stewart is with us until um, just in Mrs. time to finish the takes project. over yeah. though, right? So any, yeah. if there are, if there's any input on this, sure. it, the, as you sort of indicated, some sort of survey that might, um, you would be answering that yes. survey and providing that information to say, well, you know, if there was space, these, this is, this is a type of a program or an, or a uh, that I, that I would that we would try or to. Or even bring back. thinking down the road, you know, in mm -hmm. the future, who are right. the children? Right, right, not next year, and and three yeah. years, five years. Uh, I just have one other um, question. I know we're talking a lot about sort of the neighborhood approach that we have, um, and I think that it's uh, really important that we, you know, are thinking big picture here. Um, because we and we spent a lot of time on this we we have uh, our our preschool is is here in our high school most of the classrooms and our uh, kin kindergarten capacity is a significant issue and it, it does seem that through this budget cycle m many of us on the committee had come from different perspectives about um, you know whether the town someday would would fund uh, an operating over override for full day K or whether the state would eventually own up to the fact that they they tell us this is the program they want to see kids in but they don't fund it so probably neither of those two things are going to happen and i think we need to make sure that part of this is looking at what's the optimal solution that's going to allow us to serve um to serve people and that may mean a different way of looking at how we do preschool and kindergarten so i just want to make sure that that's you know where we're, yes. we're you know blowing the box open a little too Versus just you know looking at the schools. All right. I, think, um, I know Mr. Genap is probably. We're, we're going to go into the <laughs> other reports. We're going to give him a minute to step out. Is that correct? Yes. Mrs. Dowd? We, we are going to release him. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Very much. Tomorrow. Have a good night. Okay, Mrs. Dowd, we have. Couple more updates here or? we do we also wanted to give a quick update on turf 2 so as I mentioned during my report the amount that was in the capital plan was approved by Finance Committee and is moving on to town meeting so we have continued the working group has continued to meet with um, the design team that was hired on the project to review the scope, um, which again, as a reminder, is replacing turf two inclined with 
light. So that is the focus of the project currently. Based upon the pre preliminary design drawings and cost estimates, we are confident that the funding that we recommended and has moved forward as part of the town meeting warrant will be sufficient to accomplish that goal based upon everything we have seen to date. The next steps is we are getting some revised rendering of the drawings and some ad alternates that we are going to bring back to the larger working group, which would be comprised of both Dr. Doherty, um, Bob, myself, Joe, as well as athletics and recreation, just so everyone can see all of the sort of revised drawings and, and what the recommendations are. If the project is approved, we do feel we will be ready to put this out to bid and work with the town accountant to determine the timing of the award so that we know when we can actually be shovel ready. At this time, it looks like the work would be able to begin late summer, early fall with Turf 2 coming back online in mid-November. Again, a lot of this is dependent upon final approving, <coughs> final <coughs> approval through town meeting, also depending upon when the bid hits the street and we get all of the cost estimate back. That does tend to be a very busy time for a lot of these contractors, so it will depend upon their availability, which is why we're giving a broad range of when we think the work can start. That also can potentially impact the pricing, depending if we try to move the timing forward during the busiest time. So we're allowing for all the different options, but um, as of now, we do feel confident that we'll be, we will be ready to put a bid package out once the funding is approved and then ideally begin the work over the summer. Questions? So the, it does appear that we're going to use the, probably have to use some of the, at yes. least we the have, we, can, we budgeted. Yeah. We have continued to work um, with Kate and her team through Tom Zaya to make sure that arrangements are being made for all of the fall sports. Right. I was getting my seasons yes, wrong. Correct. All of the fall sports to ensure that we have alternate plans in place. We're working very closely with Jenna and recreation. So everybody is working under the assumption that it will be offline until mid November and then it'll be a pleasant surprise if we are able to pull it off sooner than that. But Mr. Robinson. So I've seen a lot of the maybe the youth teams uh, practicing out there, and maybe tonight actually. Uh, is in it so it's safe to be able to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. there was we've been on. doing, I'll been Joe on. speak yeah, to that. There's been, been we've been maintaining. We did maintenance up until it was done in December when yeah. we pulled the snow. Uh, we did work out there. Um, and repairs were made. We spent a, a lot of money to actually bring the field, um, repair a lot of rips in it and put more infill into it. So it's good up until. And I'm not saying that we're not going to have to do something until we take it offline. We probably will go back out there and examine it to make sure it's continued to be used up until the day we take it offline. So, one thing I did want to mention too is that, um, you know, the project isn't being done like in a vacuum or anything like that. It's being the town engineering department is heavily involved in this. DPW engineering, our town engineer, to be specific, is involved in this project, and he's one of the people on the team that sits with Gail and I and the other folks. And so without their guidance, we wouldn't really have as good of a project as we're going to have mm -hmm. because that's their, uh, that's in their wheelhouse. This is what these guys do. So the director, the assistant director, and the town engineer have been heavily involved in the project. And um, that's helping us tremendously because it's not what facilities, <coughs> we maintain it, but we're not engineers, obviously. We're not civil engineers. So those guys have been tremendously helpful. Yeah, the th that's a valid point. This has been with all three of We've these projects. It's them. been a joint effort between yeah. multiple functions yeah. within the town. And that will continue to happen. And when we're ready to get to the point where it's actually choosing, it's like almost like a programming stage for a building when you go around and you start doing, you know, like finishes, so to speak. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. when we involve the, the, the stakeholders and we say, okay, here's, a, here's the options we have for this type of turf, this type of infill and this type of um, lines that are going down. Are they stitched? Are they painted? Stuff like that. So the finishes, if you will. So, right. But um, we're getting there. It's moving along pretty well. Moving along well. There's one more update. There is one more update, which I will I will be honest at the outset and say it, it is basically a non-update update. Right. <laughs> so as you know, the building security um, 
continues to be one of the highest priorities for both the town and the schools. We've said that from the outset of this, that it is a priority. We are taking it very seriously. There is, just as a reminder for folks, an executive session of all of the elected boards, so the select board, school committee, library trustees, and the finance committee. That meeting is set for April 11th at 6 p.m. It will be up in the distance learning lab. We will have um, the security consultant will be available that night. We felt that this was a good opportunity because there have been new members to all of the various committees um, to bring everybody up to speed, especially as we go get ready to go into town meeting to ask for the funding. We do realize this is a little bit more of a difficult project where there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes that we cannot necessarily talk about. Um, so we have been spending a good amount of time going through, looking at all of the various options. We're, going, we're scrubbing the analysis that was done by the security consultants. We do have a working group that has representatives across all disciplines. So myself, I have been, we now have meetings almost every other week to go through where we are looking at items. So myself, Joe Huggins, we have representatives from the police department that we pull in. We pull in the superintendent and the town manager. We have the security consultant. We also have um, the OPM that we are required to have on the project given the, the size of it as well as the design consultants where we're doing this approach to make sure that all of the various scenarios and options we're looking at have multiple lenses based upon everybody's expertise that they're, they're bringing to the table. So there is still a lot of work going on behind the scenes and um, more to come at the April 11th executive session. Yep, Mr. Robinson. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. So we've talked about this before and I, I still question do we need the entire FinCom at that meeting? I mean, elected officials are held at a higher standard than, of care than, than appointed, uh, and that's a big board, uh, and that just gets more people in the know about things that we don't necessarily want out there. And that's no disrespect to them, I'm just, uh, and, yes. Um, there's, there's two reasons in my view. Um, the first is they are advisory to town meeting, and town meeting is being asked to authorize some debt. So the finance committee has to have some opinion based on some. And I'm not saying not the whole, no, I'm I, saying the whole committee, not. Well, and then part two to that, well, they vote as a committee, though. That, that night they will vote as a committee <coughs> on a recommendation of some sort. Um, the other part is as you enter that executive session, um, you will find out there is a form you need to sign. Okay. To make yeah. it clear to everyone in the room, please don't post this on Facebook at the end of the night. <laughs> so it is very serious, and you are not going to get the full detail by any means. But even the information you're getting is very serious. Um, you know, it is it is a very significant issue, and the material discussed and covered will never become public. Um, you know, building security unless we change all the buildings. You know, it's always going to be an executive session topic, mm -hmm. which is unusual. Most executive session topics have an expiration date. Right. Uh, this one will not. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to add to Gail's uh, summary was, <clears throat> so far there's been 500,000 of capital approved. There's, there's a $4 million debt authorization requested in April. That gives us four and a half million. There is still the possibility that the state or other sources might have grant funding available. Um, it's my anticipation as we go through the project that <clears throat> grant funds that are available, if they're large enough, they could su supplant some local funding. But if they're only a smaller, smaller amount, they may add to it. So what I'm saying and what I've said in writing for town meeting is we're only asking for four million of debt authorization this, this April. We may come back next November and ask for five, six, or seven million because someone, the state or someone else, has indicated we have grant funds. And you need to authorize the total amount including grants. So when we authorized the library project, it included the five million from the state. We, we didn't pay it, but we have to ask town meeting for permission for the larger project. 
So I just want to make it clear, as, as you can imagine in building security, you could spend any amount of money on this. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to draw the line at the very last dollar when you have four, four and a half million. So if grant funds become available, my expectation is we're going to be very interested in accepting them. And that may change where the line is drawn is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we do come back to town meeting next <coughs> November or some future town meeting, people shouldn't take it as a mismanagement of the project. <coughs> it's just in order to accept other people's money, this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And the uh, legislature, our legislators have indicated to me that um, if we're putting the shovel in the ground on July 1st, the grant funding available is zero. If we're doing something in a year from now, it, it potentially could be a, a bigger number, certainly. <coughs> so phasing the project and discussing the timing is something we're all working on also. So we don't want to miss an opportunity for someone else's money. Okay. So Bob, I just want to clarify. So it, if, it was, if the project was phased, we'd still be able to qualify for the grant funding? Because there may be things that we just feel like we need to address, you know, as immediately as we can. But There'll be certain things that logically have to be done first, such as a dispatch center and some technology and from some from infrastructure. <coughs> when you get into the actual buildings, um, <coughs> there's lots of choices. Okay. Um, and they could be done over a period of time. <coughs> That's all I had. Thank you. Um, that's not, is that all of the capital Those updates? Were, right. So the for focus these. of these meetings is really on the larger significant yes. for some of, I don't want to say they're not significant, but for some of the other normal operating capital projects, which is an oxymoron, yeah. we will give an update <coughs> more at the end of the year when um, Joe gives an update on all of the various building maintenance okay. type, but these updates we thought would make more sense to focus on the three significant capital projects and then do the annual update the way we okay. historically have. So I, I just want to make sure people, um, Ms. Dowd referenced that that meeting is uh, April 11th. It starts at 6 p.m. in the Distance Learning Center, which is upstairs here. Um, and then school well, actually, committee. you have to come you, here You'll first. start here. Oh, we're going to come here. Yeah. To order, go upstairs, okay. and then come back down for School committee does meet that night after right. that executive session. Right. So we will start here, go into that executive session, go upstairs, and then come back. Does Dr. Doxer? We have, um, Mrs. Borowski and I have office hours. So will we be meeting at oh, 530 I, I for office hours? Um, yes. If, yes. <laughs> so my sense would be that we will have the agenda be that the security update will go from 6 to approximately 7.30 to allow for time for folks to come back down here and school committee would then, so that we don't have folks necessarily waiting down here for school committee too early. Mm -hmm. And that will allow time for transition. Okay, thank you. I have late start is the next item on the agenda. Is it, did you have anything else or? Okay. <laughs> and before I, for, I do have um, gifts for <laughs> if John wants to take yes. one and then. And it's important to note that the, was the color scheme is in step with the Reading 375th color scheme. Oh, there we go. Yes. I contribute something once in a while. So in town meeting begins April 22nd. Second. Right. 22nd, 25th, 29th, and 2nd. How many nights, Bob? Uh, the world. <laughs> First one. <laughs> Three to five. Oh, do I need to look at it now? Over under. <laughs> So if you guys want to stay, you're welcome to stay and participate in the rest of the meeting. I'll go watch, I'll go watch the rest of it. You can go watch the rest of it. Don't the Red Sox? Well, the Red Sox. Go watch the Red Sox. Sox. <laughs> text us the score. Thank you both for right. attending. Thank you. I said, text us the score. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, going to do the late yeah. start update. Come on up, Miss Boyd. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Thank you. I have a pair. I don't know what your prescription is, but. Uh, so I guess I'll start. Um, 
at our December meeting when you voted to change the high school uh, start to a later start, you asked for periodic meetings of how we were planning to implement it and working on the transition. So I did, um, Kate and I worked on a memo um, outlining some of the things that we've done so far. So we wanted to highlight a few things today um, and just alert all of you and the community at large to some information that we have. So, um, so Kate, maybe you could talk about a few of the things that we've been doing and I'll talk about the website. Right. They're, uh, they're in the memo, so hopefully you've read the memo and if you've got questions, I can quickly summarize that we have met um, four, I want to say four times now with our homework and activities working group and we've come up uh, with a few early recommendations. Some of the highlights of our conversations include the three bullet points uh, at the end uh, of the bottom first page of the memo, including building availability, homework practices, sports and activity scheduling, uh, with an emphasis on balancing schedules and managing stress. So those are really the three big bucket items that we've talked about and we've made some early recommendations. The committee includes staff members, uh, administration, parents, and uh, student Autumn is uh, our student representative who is here in the audience today. So it's a well-represented group, and, and as I said before, we've met since January uh, for separate occasions. So basically, we've been meeting uh, on a monthly basis. Um, Tom and Zaya at the last meeting also gave us an update in regards to athletic scheduling and planning um, that he's been doing. So uh, in the memo, we also mentioned that um, we've updated our website. So on the Reading High website, it's, it's in your memo, but if you look at the Reading uh, Memorial High School website, there's a tab that's set on the right-hand column that says Late Start Committee Updates, and when you click on it, it's a whole page. So we have um, the PowerPoint um, and some of the information, a lot of the research that we used um, with our task force, um, and then we've added some new tabs. One of the tabs that we added is soon to be an F and Q page, but right now it's a place for people to ask questions. So we're gonna be regularly checking the, um, the survey that we put in there. So as things come up, like have you thought about this, or what about that, and, and they can really even be personal things, like my own family, this is something we're working on. So Kate and I are gonna periodically check it and get back to people, and when we see general themes, we'll add it to our F and Q page. Mm -hmm. um, so that we can, we talked about doing that, and that's something that's already um, in the mix. Um, in addition, we're, we're still ironing out the exact times that the building will be open, but we're tentatively saying that um, the building would be open at 7.30 and the CAF would be open for breakfast at 7.45. So, um, you know, we're hoping that students will take advantage of the later start. Um, that's the whole point. Um, but we also recognize that some students do want to get to school early. Their, their own circadian rhythms may be at a different place um, and also family responsibilities. We get that. So um, Kate's working out the details um, and we, we as, as mentioned in the memo, the draft time is 7.30 with the 7.45 supervision time. Um, but we'll def definitely be letting the community as a whole one of the other things that came up was about the rise start time because we wanted to adjust that so that uh, the traffic weren't all hitting at the same time. So um, as you might remember, we adjusted that um, based on the rise staff recommendation to go earlier. Um, so they will start at eight. Um, and I've checked in with Ms. Bobswick and the earlier start time, there are a few families that that doesn't work for them. Um, either their own schedules don't work with it um, but we're not worried that we're not going to be fully enrolled, of course. Um, there's nobody, uh, we, as you know, we're integrated. So we have students um, that pay tuition to go, and so that some people have choices. Um, so we are opening for business uh, with RISE at 8, and we're going to continue to monitor that. Um, you know, each year with RISE, we've had to make changes with location and timing. We've adjusted to to really try to help support families and to provide for safe access. Um, we've done it at the elementary schools that house the RISE preschool classrooms this year, and we've certainly done it at the site here. So um, we're gonna be mindful of that, and um, I will be regularly checking in with uh, Kelly Boswick about that. Yeah, so what I would say is next steps, uh, the committee, committee will meet either right before or right after April break, and as indicated on the, the top of the, the second page of the memo, the next step is to work on some recommendations, and those would be shared internally with staff 
initially and then shared uh, with school committee and the, and the public uh, once those recommendations are more fully vetted. Uh, and especially, you know, looking at um, time budgeting models and then um, managing, really helping students manage uh, stress and over scheduling. Um, that's really the lens through which the committee has been doing their work. Uh, and just a, a huge shout out to Ms. Boyden. I continue to be super impressed with her work, but she's tra taken this group and really created a professional learning community where we're talking, we're having meaningful discussions, but she's also giving, um, and, and members of the team too, giving um, selections to read so that I feel like, and we have good representation um, with staff as well. So we've really done a lot of conversing about how much is too much? And um, really looking at that time budget model, like just like you budget anything, you have X amount of hours. How, what are you gonna fit in and what are you gonna preserve? If dinner at home is a priority, then you can't, and, and I think as a community, we struggle with that. Uh, our kids are really involved in everything yeah. and that's great and they're really involved in everything and that's not always so great. So it, I think it's, as a parent myself, I've always struggled with that. Um, I think we're having meaningful discussions and giving people sort of like the liberty to say, you know what, no, this is gonna be a priority. We're gonna uh, focus on this as a family or we're gonna really realize that this time just doesn't come out of somewhere. It has to come out of the budget. So we have to sit down as a family and make those decisions. Yes, you, you have another group you want to be involved in. That's awesome. But where's that time coming from? Um, I, would, I would echo Chris's words there. And, and the committee doesn't, and Cotton, you'll agree, the committee has not always agreed. No. Right? <laughs> we've so had the, the discussions have been lively at lively times. Lively conversations, and, yeah. And that um, we've, built, we've built trust in the committee such that we can share how we feel and yet you know, they can be different, we respect one another, and then arrive at a common understanding. So they've been really rich and fruitful discussions. I have a quick question. This is on the homework, really. Um, I know it would have been in um, January, probably, that you had the, some graduates back, as you do, mm -hmm. every, you do every year. I'm wondering if you did end up having an opportunity to have this discussion with that group about, you know, the, you know, the homework that you have in college is at a different level, potentially, or how prepared they were. So did you, did you, were you able to do that? We did, we did. It was really a great conversation great. with, uh, I don't want to say about 20 to 25 uh, graduates. And um, I think one theme that popped up, and Chris, you were at the conversation as well, so jump in. But they, they really liked knowing the purpose of the homework. And so I think for, for our teachers to clarify, why, why am I giving you this homework? What, what's the purpose of it versus just Here's a worksheet to do, so what's the purpose? How does it fit in with the greater scheme of the unit and the learning objectives of the course? Mm -hmm. And then they really, really liked having that long-term plan. Like, oh. all right, here's the semester, what do I gotta do? Mm -hmm. um, and that was probably the biggest takeaway in terms of helping manage time, because if you can see your whole semester in a snapshot, you can then um, you can manage your time better where you know that this particular two weeks, I've got a really big project or a really important test that's a, a major part of my grade to, to work on and to prepare for and to study for, whereas maybe these two or three weeks, I've got a few minor homeworks and maybe I have a little bit more time to play with. So they wanted that. Um, they felt the long-term view that they got in college with like a course syllabi right. uh, was, was really valuable. So that's something that we'll be taking away and sharing with our staff. And we've already had conversations with the department heads yes. around that. Many of them were at that meeting. Um, but it, we've, we've already started talking about, you know, what does that look like? Because we don't want any sneaky surprises. You know, that's something that kids definitely felt like time management really helps if you don't have like a sneaky quiz that you didn't know about or something. Mm -hmm. Um, or like major assignments. Right, right. Mr. Robinson? So, thank you. So one of the things we, we talked about back in December was uh, engaging the, you know, recreation and the mm -hmm. youth uh, programs. Uh, Tom, and you mentioned been Tom. Actively, yep, uh, that's been Tom yep. actively working. And how is that working? Uh, it's working quite well. He's working to manage sharing field time, rescheduling field time to, to hours that are maybe not necessarily utilized to their optimal uh, extent at this point, looking at creative weekend scheduling. Uh, for the high school piece, I can say that um, the game schedules have been fairly well set for the fall, sure. and he's looking at, uh, for the high school teams, sharing practice time and sharing field time. So say, for example, you have boys and the, girls, uh, the boys and the girls varsity soccer team. Uh, one would start, do a warm up, 
have the majority of their practice, and then during the cool down, the other team would come and start their warm up. So there will be some overlapping field time. There's a potential on turf one to split the field in half and have each, um, you know, two different teams um, practice together on half of the field, or having JV and varsity practice together on the same field, which doesn't always happen in sports. So there, he's actively working on that. He's been working with uh, Town Recreation with the YMCA on scheduling. Doctor. There was a hand over there too. Oh. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we had talked about was making sure that, oh, by the way, this I felt like you answered so many of my questions um, and I really appreciated the work that you've done and that it involves students as well and especially such great students. Just had to say that. Um, one of the questions that's been raised to me and that um, we talked about was protecting that time before school and late at night so that the it didn't expand into those spaces and I was a little surprised when I saw the school would open up at 730 because mm -hmm. I was worried about students still having to be there at 730 because that whatever the logistics and then at the same time I was worried about what did that mean for teachers that wanted to get to their office and do their own work or you know, how does that all fit together and protect it, encouraging students to come later and teachers not to have a longer day? Absolutely, absolutely. So I've been actively um, in communication with the union, meeting with Jess Bailey on a regular basis about this from the teacher perspective. And um, she advocated for the building to be open on the early side because there's a lot of teachers who will not want to necessarily change their driving schedule um, because of traffic patterns and where they where they come from so they'll want to front load the work on, on on the morning end and not necessarily it, not meeting for clubs because we're not, that that was a no-go zone for us um, so we're not meeting for clubs but to be able to beat traffic patterns to have the building open on the early side to be able to get access to their classrooms and and to do the preparation work that that they want to do um, so she and I are, are continuing to have those conversations that was one of the the one of the reasons to potentially have the building open on the earlier side for, for faculty. We also heard loud and clear from, from families that they may not have the, the capability to, um, to engage in or arrange for a, a ride share uh, situation. And because of their work schedules, if they work in Boston, they may not have any other option but to bring their children to school at 7.30. So we wanted to make sure that the space was open, but we don't have anything scheduled. We have a commitment as a part of, a, of the committee, not there's no clubs that are going to be meeting before school. That is absolutely a commitment on our part, uh, so that it is really downtime for the students to ease into their day, have breakfast, socialize with friends, if if they have to be dropped off early. My sense is maybe not a lot of students will have to be, but we want to make sure that the building is a welcoming place for them to be. Um, we haven't yet broached the conversation of the library space, and that's a longer conversation. And if the building is open, we'd love to find some way, and Dr. Coram, you and I will be chatting with the PTO at some point, but we haven't broached that conversation yet um, because the PTO supports a stipend for library supervision after school. So is there a potential for that to, to shift before school uh, in the same capacity or do uh, partly before school, partly after school, some library supervision? Uh, for students who'd like to use the computers, for example, uh, or or work on a group project. Mm -hmm. I just I just want to add, actually, I know Mr. Bobbin has a question too. That when I read that, I was actually very happy to see that because um, I do remember that we had we had talked about having the capability of having the building open in sort of a uh, more more passive way for students, and I I think it is important there, um, and this sort of allows parents who, who feel like they, you know, they, they have to drop kids off earlier. Um, it's basically sort of aligned with what the, they would be currently doing now at the middle school level. So especially for maybe our freshmen and sophomores um, who, you know, this is adjustment. So I think this is excellent. I hope the, you know, we can work something out to provide um, 
basically the, the library access. And I'm really excited about the potential of having kids eat a better breakfast. I, I know I saw what my kids didn't eat on the way out the door yeah. in the morning. Most schools who have moved to late start, so. <laughs> most schools who have moved to late start said that they saw a dramatic increase in breakfast. And, and that rolling start time, I think we're, like we've talked about a lot, that rush to get in, you know, yeah. by 7.30, we're hoping that people will use this as a, as a much gentler start time. There'll be families that will take advantage of getting here at 8.25, right? right? Right in time and, and get that full hour of sleep extra. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be families because of either their own child's needs or their own family needs that might need our support a little bit more. We're, we're just trying to be fair to, to, to everyone with that. Mr. Bogan? Yeah, what's going on with the Metro students? How are they participating in this process? I don't see any mention of them. In the memo. Yeah, I didn't mention it in the memo. I know when um, Mr. Cross came, he's still working out the exact timing. Unfortunately, I think the Medco students are still going to be here relatively early. They'll probably be at the earlier start of this opening time. Um, and our hope is that if we do have breakfast and the library open, it'll be a little softer start for them um, rather than when now they get to school and we start right away. Um, a lot of it has to do with traffic patterns um, and beating the traffic. If they wait till 8.30, they're not going to get here by 8.30. Um, in addition, as you know, we, we share buses. So um, some of our kids are at middle school. So we may, we may win a few minutes. I think he said when he was here, maybe 10 minutes. Um, they may get a little, little bit of a break in the morning instead of meeting the bus at 5.45. They'd meet the bus at 5.55 or something. We're working out the details with the bus company as we speak. Um, you know, these, the Medco families that um, honor us by sending their kids to Reading, they make a huge personal sacrifice and those kids are up really early and on the bus. And it's a long bus ride and, you know, having commuted into Boston um, in one of my other former districts, like that's a brutal commute and it's reversed, but don't tell anyone it's reverse anymore. So the reality is that, you know, they, they're used to bus rides. Um, we do some playaways on the bus. You know, we try to encourage them to um, not only just enjoy each other on the bus, but, you know, do some thinking about schoolwork or, or even do some schoolwork. It's a long ride no matter how we slice it. So we're going to do the best we can with that, but the reality is this late start doesn't infect them positively as much as I wished it. it because of the traffic. Yes, Ms. Bobbin. They're, they're on the same, aren't they on the same bus that they were before because they share with the middle school? So they are, but they have to get here in time for high school now. So they're like, they come, they come, um, they are like here at like seven. They're here about seven, seven oh five. Seven oh five. Now. So now, now they're here, wait. So now they would drop the middle school first next year and then here. So they probably won't be here until after 7.30. So they'll, It'll allow us, like I said, it'll be about 10 minutes later picking up in Boston. So there's an extra drop off. That's why I was looking at the 7.30 time. Mm -hmm. When does school would start? 7 7.50? 7.50 is when school starts. 7.40 is when they can start. So, yeah. And then second question is, so we've got 7.40 at Coolidge. Next door you've got Birch Meadow at 8.25. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the high school at 8.25, 8.30. We were good with the police and the traffic Yeah, pattern. remember the uh, Deputy Chief Clark came. I do remember that, yeah. but we're, we're satisfied with. We're going to do a fair amount of outreach as we have with other things, like um, with election day traffic and other things. Um, we're going to try to do a, a media blitz um, in August and kind of remind people of the traffic patterns and the police are going to work with us. They've, they've said that they're committed to, to, you know, to this, so. Mr. Coram. So uh, if I could go back, you said something about there will be no clubs before school. I know that there are a couple of, at least yeah. one club that my daughter participates in that does meet before school. Is that a new policy then that this club would have to find a new I time? I think for consistency sake, that would be something that we would recommend as a committee. It okay. has not been fully fleshed out, but that would be a recommendation in terms of the conversations that we've had um, for consistency sake. And um, you mentioned, you know, kind of budgeting your time and figuring out for, you know, how many activities. Um, I don't know, is there, I guess I'd, I'd be reluctant to encourage a, a, um, a hard limit on that, but oh, no. I don't know how you fight against 
you know, that, that if you look at the college application stuff, which, you know, you and I know <laughs> right, d right this time, yeah. um, that, you know, there's definitely a, a pressure to in be involved in more things. So how do we... Yeah, so in, in one of the resources that I shared with the committee, it's a book called Overloaded and Underprepared. Uh, uh, Chris shared the link, a, a link to it there. Mm -hmm. One of the chapters has um, a really simple template that allows students to gauge if I want to take, say, these five AP classes, general amount of homework required per night for each of these classes is X number of hours. There's 24 hours in a day. I've got six hours of, of school per day, six and a half. I've got three hours of practice, this many hours of homework. Where, where do I fit it in? So it allows, in a general sense, for students to, um, to begin to make informed choices about how how they want to spend their time. Is family time important? Is friend time important? Is downtime important? Is swim practice more important? So it allows students to be able to budget their time and make decisions. The committee really, really liked that template and it's something, uh, in fact, in the former advisory um, program that existed at the high school, there was a time management uh, component that, that, uh, that students were exposed to. So we're looking back at some of that old material to see if there's something that, that exists already in-house versus just taking a template from, from the book. But the committee really liked that to allow families in the scheduling process, perhaps, with counselors to say, okay, can you really fit this all in? You have a job, you have a babysitting responsibility with children, you know, with your siblings, you have sports, and you have these high-powered classes that you want to take with this X amount of homework. Can you really fit it in? Let's make some informed decisions. So it's not hard and fast, but it allows for that informed conversation. Kate also uh, did a nice job at the Future Freshman Night talking to families about that, that every family and every child is different, right? So, you know, I mean, within my own family, I had kids that needed bedtime and some that could stay up later doing homework and all of that. So it's definitely individual. The last thing we want to do is limit people's choices. We're going to continue to offer tons. Right. But I think that as a family, folks really have to sit down and say, you know, what feels right for our child at this time? And I think we need to help them with some of the tools for that. Question about the program. Um, can I go? No, I think you were. All right, Dr. Doxer. All right, let's, we'll try to just have a couple more questions because we still have a couple more um, updates to do. Another question that I've been asked is about um, the for pay bus. So people that live within the two mile that wouldn't, um, and there is no high school bus anyways outside of two miles. I understand that. But there was a way to pay for bus transportation. And so the question was. I'll answer. So first of all, under Massachusetts state law, we are not required to provide transportation at the high school level. So we do have uh, an opportunity for students in certain parts of town to have a uh, paid bus. So they pay a fee. Um, if you remember, we did um, a memo when I was explaining how we were going to handle the half-day kindergarten piece next year, mm -hmm. and that I outlined the busing, because we have, we essentially have two buses. Each bus has three tiers. So the first tier next year is going to be the middle schools. They're going to be the earliest route, followed by the high school, followed by the elementary. So each bus is going to go to different parts of town. We have existing routes right now at the high school. We will continue to have those routes. We may be able to tweak those routes a little bit, um, depending on you know, location and need, but we are not going to be able to provide busing all over Reading for high school. Um, that's, that's just the, the reality. So we'll be sending out information in June regarding that. Um, Thank you. And if we're able to change the route slightly, uh, we will to accommodate as many as possible. Thank you. I just um, just to add a clarified with Dr. Darty, it's been a long time since um, well I walk I came to Reading High and did live two miles away. We didn't have paid buses at the time, um, but people can students can walk um, to a they could walk you know maybe it might might it won't be two miles it might be a third of a mile it might be a quarter of a mile also to a bus stop they could walk the to they a designated bus stop yes. so the route 
the routes aren't going to be able to be expanded because of the time frame. But students, and I know actually when I went to elementary school, we walked to the bus stop. So, um, you know, hopefully that, that that will help. Plus the other piece of that is what um, Chris and Kate just talked about was opening the school, allowing school to be open um, at 730. And that would should help accommodate maybe those families that you know, aren't able to accommodate getting to their kids to school at that later time and take advantage of the, of the time the, to sleep. The, the proposed start for, for when the high school will be open is very consistent to an eight, what middle school students would be getting dropped off at the middle school. So if these are freshman parents that would normally be dropping their child as when they were eighth same. graders around 7.30 to Coolidge or Parker, they'll be able to do the same thing right. at the high school. Um, Mr. Bob. Yes, yeah, so Ms. Boynton, one of the things you mentioned was scheduling, and it's a 24-hour day. I really like that, mm -hmm. right? And I think when we had our discussion about changing the start time, we talked a lot about adding something into the 24-hour day, which we hope will be an extra hour of sleep. Mm -hmm. We can't control that, but we hope that uh, this rescheduling will allow for that for a student. Um, unless I travel at the speed of light, I don't know how to fit 25 hours into a 24-hour day. <laughs> Um, so something's got to give, yes. right? If we, if we, there's, there's that 57 minutes. You, you did manage to squeeze a little bit off the hour. So we did our best. The That's, yep. I think you picked up three or four minutes, but, um, what are we, I, I'm not at these meetings with the committee, so I'm really interested in your perspective and what you're hearing, um, both from, you know, an academic point of view, but I really want to focus on extracurricular. What are we doing to discuss with coaches, teachers, moderators, people who have a certain expectation of what is available for that activity, be it a sport or, or a club or, or whatever it is. We used to have a certain amount of time for that activity. Are we, are we thinking of this in turn the conversations as just shifting that same period of time later? Because then I think we're in danger of no. 24 after oh, hours yeah. and running out of time instead of 25, as opposed to shortening the activity or staggering the activity or forcing selection between yeah. activities that never had to be made before. Because you know that, that to me is a real danger. And I think we, we heard some, some public comment at this original meeting about the danger of just taking, let's say, a two-hour activity, shifting it forward an hour, expecting two hours out of the student, and now you're actually taking away the sleep that you were trying to give back because right. everything is just shifted an hour. Yeah. We are absolutely not talking about adding time on to the rest of the day. So just as you said, it's about staggering. Uh, it's about alternating. It's about shortening. Even you know, uh, Mr. Zaya was talking about, so let's take our, the two sports that really are time-bound in terms of space, swim, and hockey, and it is they are, they are condensed. So instead of a two hour practice, it's a 45 minute practice or an hour practice. So it is those very conversations that are happening. Um, and Chris and I and the committee are, are very committed to uh, a certain end time for especially practices and rehearsal times, mm -hmm. uh, games, performances. Those are things that are largely out of our control, uh, but perform, uh, practices and, um, and rehearsals are within our control, so bringing some reason into that um, and not just, we can't simply tack in a, an hour or the activities on to the end of the day. That is absolutely not a recommendation uh, nor an expectation of the committee at all. Uh, Mr. Quorum, did you have a question? No, I'm fine, thank you. You're okay. Um, from the audience, Mr. Wise. Thank you, Tom Wise, South Street. Ms. Boynton, thank you very much, and Ms. Kelly, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I'm coming not with my potential candidate hat on, but more my historical hat of uh, Reading United Soccer uh, as a former administrator there. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we're having a bit of a challenge with the communication uh, or lack thereof uh, in making sure that the forecasting and the planning for the fall is, is accounted for and we're being included and not just being told, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, so I would hope and encourage, um, I'm very thankful for what I'm hearing about you know, sharing field space, uh, junior varsity and junior varsity and things like that, that's amazing, especially considering in the fall we're also facing turf two limitations. Um, so I know there's a lot of moving parts, but I would say please, please continue to reach out or ask Mr. Zaya to reach out more frequently uh, and maybe even bring them in. Um, you know, the Reading Youth Little League, I mean, Reading Youth Lacrosse is also planning to start a league in the fall. Historically, they've only done spring. So that's going to add more capacity problems to the space as well. 
So I just would request, please bring them in sooner than later, um, because right now we're not hearing anything. Okay. Thank you very much for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. Thank you very much. That was a really Thanks, great Dave. update. Appreciate allowing all the questions. We um, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, we have two items of old business, the personnel report and the budget update. Jen. 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 Bovey. Yep, Ms. Bovey. <laughs> Ms. Bovey. Sure. She's going to do that. Personnel first and then the back to Mrs. Dowd. Um, so I'm going to just walk through, similar to how I have uh, in the past, just through the, in, um, the report in, in its entirety, um, which isn't overly long tonight. Um, and then obviously once I'm, I'm done, feel free to ask any questions okay. that you may have. Um, so this is the second quarter personnel report. Um, it's for the um, relevant personal, action, uh, personal actions through the dates of December 15th uh, through March 15th. What you're going to see um, is this first table that we've included in every um, report so far. Um, again, outlining just for your, um, just for you to look back on regarding our biweekly, um, <clears throat> our, sorry, our biweekly hours transformed into our FTEs. What we've done moving forward is we've treated all of the positions in um, in FTEs, so we do have to make some conversions for that. So there's, there's just a key for you, again, mm -hmm. outlining that. Um, we've hired uh, two new employees within this time period for a total of um, 0.96 FTEs, so you'll see that represented in Table 1. And these are newly hired employees, new to the district. <clears throat> And then followed by that is table two, which outlines of those uh, newly hired positions, those people into the newly hired positions, which of those, um, we typically have multiple tables, but in this case, both of these positions um, were budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, so we had someone in the position prior who left the position, and now these um, new hires are coming in to fill that. Um, so both of those were budgeted positions which table two represents, you'll see the FTEs on the bottom of that table as well, 0.96, um, which match to table one. Um, our third table outlines currently what open job requisitions we have for, um, for this fiscal year, for the 18-19 school year. You will see that uh, some of the positions are italicized, meaning that those positions um, are currently listed here in the open job recs, but we actually are um, either have just made an offer and are in the stages of onboarding someone for the position. Um, so it's not completely closed out, um, but it is about to be. So all of the positions that are italicized um, are ones that we are moving forward with someone on um, and or have just finished doing so and or are currently onboarding. Um, and then our table four is um, we're moving into now planning ahead for for next year and filling vacancies for uh, next fiscal year. So we do have some current open job requisitions um, that are in fact not for this fiscal year, but are currently open within um, within this quarter for us. Um, so you'll see similarly italicized um, our positions that we currently have either made an offer on and or in the process of onboarding someone into the position. Um, so at this point, um, we had no other um, relevant teacher, any resignations. In the past, you've seen a, a chart for our resignations. Um, that's not relevant for this quarter, um, so that you, you will not see there. Um, that is essentially the outline um, of the second quarter. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. Are the FY20 Due to retirements primarily, or the what? The FY20 positions. Some With each, some are retirements, um, and yes, mainly, and we have um, some of the positions which are actually um, going to be filled because there's going to be a vacancy in them, mm -hmm. okay. due to a resignation and or a separation. Okay. But yes, I would say at this point, 
positions that we're filling are often because we know it well in advance, which more likely or not is because it's a retirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to go with Mr. Coram first. Okay. Wait, did Mr. Bobbin have his hand up, though? It's your choice. Either. All right, Mr. Coram, because okay. he's got far fewer. So uh, I recall before there was a 0.6 FTE for RMHS that was part of the override budget um, that was going to be then maybe a uh, transition person. I don't see that in the open table. Yes, so we and Dr. Dari and I actually recently had a conversation, as we always do when we complete these and kind of reflect back. Um, what we've historically done with the reports is base them off of newly hired employees and have reflected on that. We have a lot of actually moving parts that we are, that happen internally um, with internal transitions and or transfers, um, which historically have not been reflected. Um, so we recently had a conversation about that um, at the beginning of this week, um, kind of moving forward how we can better capture. So that position um, is actually one that we're looking, um, it's not completed as of yet, but are looking to actually fill internally. Um, that FTE was transformed into our um, transition program teacher at the high school. Um, so that is someone who actually is not coming from outside of the district. We'll be looking to have someone within the district enter into that position shortly. It was, it was point eight, just to clarify. Yes, and thank eight. you. Okay. So it's in the process of basically yeah. being yes. filled. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. which would mean that at this point, all of the, those override positions okay. are filled. filled. Uh, Mr. Bobbin. So the director of student services, that's Jennifer. Yes, yeah. Okay, so that's filled. <laughs> and then the team chair, that's special ed as well? Yep. Correct. Okay, so if I add up the special ed there, I get about 6.87. If I take a third of 550, or 30% of 550, it's 165, which is roughly the number of FTE and special ed. So if you do divide those two numbers reversed, about four percent of more than 25 people are new to special ed, to special ed cost center seems high is that high or not one in 25 are being first year people in a cost center is that abnormally I mean, high i would say honestly i don't think it's it doesn't jump out to me personally okay. um i mean seems about right. we have i, I don't want to call it turnover I think that that's I mean we oftentimes have people who it might not be someone who's moving out of the district there may be other reasons as to why moves have been made out from those positions um, we do see a lot of times um, that th those power roles I will say if that's I think mainly what you're referring to are you referring to table I'm sorry you said table three correct table three, yeah. correct um, oftentimes I will say throughout that within the year we're more often seeing those roles opening up. So to me, that's not, I, I don't think that's anything that I feel is different this year from previous years. Um, I think it's very common for that, for that role a lot of times, um, you know, and hopefully it is that they're good and they're staying in district with us and they make an internal move. Um, a lot of times those roles end up finding um, positions that they may have been seeking in the beginning year, a teaching role, and that didn't happen. Um, and they continue their search and they end up finding it. So um, more often than not, that's what I see with those positions. So it doesn't strike me as overly concerning to see that. I mean, I'm also thinking not just in terms of retention, but also in terms of um, how experienced, well, there's budget, but how experienced are the people yep. that are working with our most vulnerable population with that population? They may be very experienced before, but just mm -hmm. thinking about wanting to retain people and, and having that continuity, especially in special ed, I think is something that is worth keeping an eye on and, and doing everything we can to retain people who, who are excellent educators with our students. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, and I, I mean, and as far as them turning over, I don't fully, is that what you're referring to? Like the, the having new enter into those roles and the concern for a new. There's just a lot of special ed on this chart. Dr. Dart, let me. So I, I think there needs to be some clarification. Some of these positions are positions that we had to add this year. Okay. And, and which, I will, yeah, two of those are. So let's um, retain, let's hire good people, retain them, and just keep an eye on the fact that you have a lot of people getting up to speed at the same time. That's where I'm going with this, is that if people are new, 
it's, they're, they're all going up that learning curve in, in their work. And so we want to think about supporting them in every way we can. That, that's very challenging to come to a new educator role in a new district. So we've got a number of new people, including the head of the, the class center. Uh, can, I, can I ask though, are the paraeducators typically, they're not typically <coughs> like brand new to these roles. Are they more typically experienced people? Yeah, more typically yeah. you see them coming. Yes. A lot, of, yeah, a lot of times too, they're um, actually very familiar with our district more often than not. Um, we actually pull a decent amount from our substitute pool as well, which is great, but also then we're short on poses short some on challenges. <laughs> um, but I would say more often than not, they're not only um, have had previous experience in those roles um, and or have been working with the district in other capacities in those similar type of roles. So I wouldn't say we're always seeing them come in completely fresh and completely new to, to the populations. And, and a lot of times they are licensed educators. Correct. They're licensed yeah. teachers. More often than not. More often than not. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Jen. We'll move on Thank you. to the budget update. Mrs. Dowd. So included within your packet tonight is the second quarter budget update. So we have continued to use the same format that we have historically on here to give the updates. So as reflected in the memo, we're currently projecting a surplus of approximately 288,000, which is less than 1% of the school's total operating budget. As we've discussed throughout this process, um, we do continue to face the challenges within the special education Budget. Sharon and I, um, Chris, as well as Sharon's assistant, Anne Marie, meet, I want to say, on a weekly basis for a couple of hours at least every week to go through all of the various line items from staffing to movements within the out of district tuition and transportation. We're looking at the legal line, the consultation line. So we are constantly meeting and, and fine tuning the numbers. As you will remember, when we did this in February, we did indicate to the school committee at that time that we did anticipate that we would be coming back at this time to potentially look for additional transfers because the process we're taking is we're requesting it as we are getting more known certainty um, as to any settlements or to, that was just a distracting on that. Yeah. That wasn't <laughs> <really>. um, <laughs> So as we get more certainty around whether it's the legal invoices, consultative services, we're, we're fine tuning it and asking for the transfers as we go. As we did mention, we have um, three school psychologists that are all gone out at the same time on maternity leave. So for situations like that, we do find ourselves paying three times for the same position because a person is on maternity leave receiving payment we are bringing substitutes in to cover part of their services and then based upon the substitutes we're getting, we have had to consult out for some of the testing services that they would normally do. So Sharon and I are working very closely to contain those costs, but that is one of the more expensive positions to fill and when you have three out at the same time, we also aren't able to tap into our own internal resources at from what I'm understanding is a very busy time. Yes. Mm -hmm. of year as well. Um, one of the items that we are also doing is we are working through the Circuit Breaker Extraordinary Relief Fund information. That filing um, is due tomorrow as to whether or not we're actually going to meet the hurdle and qualify for it. We, we do not know yet, but even if we did reach the hurdle, there is no guarantee as to funding. So we will be able to give the committee an update at the next meeting on that, but we do continue to explore every avenue that we can. We have been monitoring the revolving funds as well, and we are comfortable with the balances and where we are now that we feel confident we'll be able to take the offsets, the ones that we do continue to monitor that we don't always know until the end of the year are the extracurricular and use of school property just based upon how some of those revolving accounts run, we don't have all of the expenses in and, and receipts this early on, but as of now, we are comfortable with 
those balances um, in our ability to take the offsets. So at this point, we are requesting a transfer of 200,000 from regular ed into special ed to cover the known expenses that we have currently. And again, we will continue to monitor if we are able to get any additional funding or any of the items change, we would look to either prepay tuition or transfer funds back into reg ed. But again, there are still some unknowns, so we will be redoing this process um, and coming back with an update in the May timeframe. The other item we did want to let the committee know as we are looking to be it to expand upon some of the information that we're providing, we have included an additional memo in here that summarizes our grant funding to date. So this was, as um, Chris indicated earlier, this we pulled this together at the end of last week, beginning of this week, and then we just found out we received additional grant funding that's not reflected on here yet. But I know we have been asked throughout the budget process and throughout this year, are we actively seeking out grant funding? So we did want to provide the committee an update to say that we do actively seek out, you know, every $5,000 helps when it's for a specific purpose. You will see that most of the entitlement grants did have increases. That is normal. The federal government gives you your initial amount and then once or twice during the year they can increase or decrease the allotment. The one not so great news is that the special education pro, um, professional program, improvement, program improvement program grant. grant that historically we have received last year was very late. We did get notification that that grant is no longer available so last year we received just over sixteen thousand dollars of funding that was used for professional development um, we did receive an increase in the idea grant we believe that because the other grant dried up some of that funding was then converted into the idea grant um, so we thought it would be helpful to show the committee changes in the grant funding the last update we gave on that was in december and then there are a couple of other grants that we are looking into. We're not sure whether or not they, we will actually be successful or if they fit in with what we're doing. But we did want to let the committee know that we are actively looking at other opportunities. So we thought that would be another, to the extent there are changes in the grant funding, to be able to show the committee changes throughout the year. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Mr. Bobbin? So, Gail, is this memo just one quarter's worth of expenses or one half a year's worth of expenses? This would be the, um, one half the year expenses. So I always do a year-to-date view year -to -date, so okay. we see where we're trending against the entire budget. So the 313.780 deficit in special ed, that's half a year? That is half a year less what we already transferred. We did a transfer of 250000 December. in December. Okay, so this is this is tracking it closer to nine percent over rather than four and a half percent. So again, there's that there's that man again, ten percent. Yep. These expenses are growing consistently at ten percent over what we can even estimate them at, based on a reasonable assumption of the known knowns because of the unknown unknowns, Correct. which are the tuition increases and the transportation increases, which we cannot control. Correct. Which is why we worked very diligently with the town so that next year we do have, we still, it may not be enough, but we were able to secure the additional 300,000 next year. So, and I said we do meet every week for at least two to three hours a week where we're person by person, bill by bill. There's just and that much uncertainty. In what there is, and I, I will say we, we had the joyous revelation that in addition to the reconstruction budgets where every six years you can get increases, there is an, a, another avenue the schools can go through where they can request almost an emergency increase in tuition and we have received at least one of those where the increase became effective this year in February. So we're there, there are a lot of unknowns. You're talking about area. from an out of district placement. Out of district, out of district. Yes, sorry, out of private placement. Yeah. So we're, we're moving four to five percent. Brought, I was gonna. I wasn't gonna ask because you weren't talking about FY20. But yep. where are we with that? Do we know uh, with you 
the reconstruction I think the, the collaborative and stuff have we gotten any Nothing feedback in terms of how much they want to get their increases? We have been, I like Sharon, she's been tracking a lot of the private. Yeah, I mean, for the private day or the private residential schools that have requested that, we have participated in the Q&As that we're allowed to, to really kind of better understand <coughs> uh, what the rationale is for those requests. And then the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed take it under advisement. They work with what's called the Operational Services Division, who makes the final determination of what they can charge. And then we get just get a letter. So it's not, we don't get. So by attending those, do you get a sense for where they're headed, what they're going to ask for, or not? Oh, sure, yeah. We don't really get a good sense as to how the department is evaluating the information and the questions asked. Um, they don't really share kind of what their opinion is about what they're hearing in those uh, conversations. So what happens is we then just get a letter if we have a child currently placed there um, as to what the rate will be for next year. And we... I think there's only one that's been confirmed so far for next year. And we've, you know, updated our FY20 budget with that number. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to have Mr. Bobbin ask one more question, and then Dr. Doxer read our motion. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I'm just reading your, your summary of the special ed on, in your memo, which is very good, by the way, on page two. And... So to be, just kind of clarify what I said before, because I, I just, the writing is very clear in front of me, but not everyone sees that. So it, my impression is that we're moving four to five percent into the uh, over budget, into the cost, into the special ed budget. We're not over budget overall. We're just in the special ed, and and that is a pattern, right? We've seen it three quarters in a row, I think, maybe mm -hmm. four quarters in a row that I remember. That at least the last two, and it, and it's this four to five percent every quarter, another four to five, which is two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and. You say in your memo that's being driven by a combination of factors, but increases in tuition, so providing existing services at a higher rate because rates are reset. Mm -hmm. Fair? Mm -hmm. So same reason. services for our students that's just going to cost more to provide them. Um, to, I don't see transportation here, but that's something we've talked about in the past, bus contracts increase. Is that in here? Oh, it's on the back. Okay. And then what I'm trying to understand is this, is this a, and then the other thing you mentioned is just increased student need. Right, that there, then there are students that need more intensive support, and then that is, we couldn't have known that that would occur, so how can you budget for it? Is, is that, are, are those a kind of fair representations of yep. what's driving those that 4 to 5 percent yeah. increase? It's yep. not something that, that we missed, it's not something we could have predicted, and it's not something we control, and it's something the student needs. Mm -hmm. That's there, a fair those assessment, fair yeah. summary, yep. Oh, absolutely, I don't doubt that, but. I think what's concerning is Sorry, I didn't mean. Yeah. Is you know, histor recent historic historically we've been able to shift money. There may be a day where there isn't money in regular day to be able to do this. You know, that's a yeah, difficult that's day when yeah. we deal with that. That day. Yeah. Right at our budgets, <laughs> budgets. Dr. Doxer? Um, to that point, I was really appreciative of the letter written by our administration to our legislators, and I was wondering if we could do the same. So I actually said I would do that. I need to just um, work. I, I, need, I want to find out what if MASC has sort of a recommendation, so I'll, I'll work on that Thank on behalf you. of the committee. Um, can you read the motion, Dr. Doxer? Oh, uh, Mr. Wise. Sorry, one quick, one quick point of clarification, and it might be a small number, so tell me it's inconsequential. Um, but you specifically mentioned here that the, uh, you know, continue to meet our obligations to continue child find responsibilities while covering leaves of absence of several school psychologists, mm -hmm. as yep. part of the, uh, the deficit in special education and on both on both charts. Mm -hmm. um, but in the budget book, school psychologists are in the general education, not in the special education bucket. So why do we need to move money from general ed to special ed and make special ed look more expensive when they would otherwise be covered by general ed? 
Fair question. The um, school psychologists perform or work with general education students um, in every school and mm -hmm. for a substantial part of their yep. week. The part of their test responsibility is to test and evaluate under the child fund. I understand. Um, and when the, the school psychologist has gone out on a leave, what we've had to do this year is hire someone from a guidance background to fill the counseling needs that remain. The testing piece is all around the special ed child fine. So we've had to contract for that with a you know private local agency to come in with the school psychologist. So that those dollars are specifically around the special education child fund. So it's essentially because of a muni's bucketing rule because you're contracting for a special ed thing yes. Yes, to fill the, that, the gap. That the That's rationale. why it has to work that way. Yep, to put that whereas That's the that school line psychologist item. is one individual that is all recorded within the regular education world, but because this is a specific subset, we yeah. can specifically identify it becomes a special education cost. Does it make sense in the future? And I, I, I look at all these things, you got 0 0.5, 0 0.46, 0 0.1, 0 0.71. Does it make sense in the future to budget some school psychologist time in the special education budget so this type of move doesn't have to happen? The challenge with that is I, I do not know when individuals are going out on maternity leave. This was, I. I mean, it's only my third year doing this. This is the yep. first year I've had three individuals go yep. out such that we've then had to contract okay. it this way versus being able to fill it under the regular education umbrella. So it does become, I can't predict in the future the maternity leaves of our teaching. I, I understand that. I guess my point was if they're going to be doing child find related services, you know, because they have to, right? We have to. They're going to spend some of their time doing some of those services. Yeah, Maybe it's proportional, 40, yeah, 60, whatever. Split the FTE yeah. out. Yeah, split the FTE out. Exactly, yeah, Sharon, that's asking. what I'm thinking. Um, just so, think you know, it makes it aligns their work responsibilities maybe a little bit better. Um, just an idea for the future. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Doxer, can you read our motion? Yes. Move to authorize a transfer of $200,000 to the Special Education Cost Center from the regular day cost center utilizing salary savings from staff turnover, unfilled positions, and staff extending leaves of absence in the regular education cost center. Sorry? 200,000. Oh, at the beginning. Yeah, it was the fifth word. Can I get a second? Second. Mr. Cor Dr. Coram, second. Um, is there, we've had a lot of discussion so far. Is there any additional discussion or questions? Is, is 200000 the right amount? I, what I usually do is I round up the number so that we, in case there are any items that come up between now and May, we have the funding to cover any invoices rather than ask for the specific dollar amount. So I believe it is slightly less than the 200000 but I... I round it up and then to the extent we wouldn't need it, we could transfer it back. Right. So but since we do not do another update until May, we wanted to make sure we had some flexibility in those numbers. Right. So the number, it looks like the deficit is actually 160 and the overall surplus is 288. There's no other... So, so I, Mr. So it's the bottom number on page two of, for special ed. Is that the number? You want? So it's yeah, the we're one. On the page so one. the deficit currently is one fifty nine nine, so approximately one sixty. Oh, so you. we're asking to transfer yeah. two hundred, just so th these are all estimates, not and necessarily the next, exact. Yeah. So. The next time we would be able to revisit this is when a May. quarter in, from now. In May. May. I believe it's the end of May would end be May. the next yeah, yeah, update. May would be like May thirtieth. <coughs> You're asking for an extra 26 percent <laughs> over 200 over 159. Again, it's a transfer, and I think it's something that we've we've done. We certainly have done before in the past. Everyone's good with the amount. I'm fine with the amount. I, I, I understand that we want to round it up a little bit, and since the surplus is projected at 288, there's there's room to take a little bit more right. than is presently budgeted as a note expense. 
extra expense. And extra what this would 000. avoid is potentially coming back off cycle to ask for a one-off transfer right, right, right. if a bill came in larger than we anticipated or something else transpired. All right, and there's, there's enough, this extra 40,000 is coming out of regular day? It's all coming out of regular day. Yeah, it can go back there if it has to. Not before May. Huh? As long as, long as we're confident that moving the money out of regular day beyond what would be projected for special ed is something that isn't gonna impact regular day, I'm okay with this. Right, there's still an $88,000 surplus currently. Right, so we're, we're so. pulling 40 of that 88, we're pulling half that surplus out. No, we're going to pull, no. it, it's 288,000. 288, okay. Right, so we're pulling to basically right. 200 of that, so yeah. All right, thank you. All right, all those in favor? And the vote carries 5-0. Um, I believe that's it. I, we went through remembering that the meeting on the 11th starts at 6. Dr. Doxer indicated the office hours will be at, uh, office meeting. half hour will be at 5.30. Um, we will come here and uh, basically come into session and then go into the executive session upstairs. And we will not have Mr. Robin and Dr. Coram with us. Is there going to be any discussion of the correspondence? Um, typically, there is not. Um, um, so like to we do have matter, Dr. Coram. I am a, a little interested to hear more on the math update, um, in particular the, the material that was presented here. Um, I don't know if, I, I mean, it was not presented. Sorry, the, the, the packet. No, that, that so we, we do Kelly. have, um, right, there were eight correspondences, letters to the legislators uh, that were talked about, and responses to emails. I believe um, Assistant Superintendent Kelly responded on the, to the math question. Is that the? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a particular interest of mine, from my background. Um, I, I don't think know if you want. I don't know if Mrs. Kelly wants to, do you have a specific question on it she can answer, or do you, would you, are, were you interested in having so her just go So I guess it? I had a couple of, of points to that. Um, I think I remember last year here with Mr. Martin, and we looked at the MCAS results for algebra students in eighth grade and found that all of them were proficient, uh, sorry, advanced. Um, and Mr. Martin said that, you know, maybe we needed to look at the, the cutoff criteria for the people that were the students that were getting into that because, you know, that, that sort of indicated we, we cut the, put the threshold too high, that too few students were getting in, we were only getting the very, very top, and they were all turning out advanced, and that you'd expect to see, you know, a couple of students that were kind of, you know, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't, and they might struggle. So anyway, the point was that we should be letting more of them into algebra in eighth grade. Um, and it sounds like from the responses here that we're looking to cut that down and push most of the kids into algebra in ninth so grade. So no, we're not looking to cut it down. Um, okay. I think uh, I worked primarily on this memo with the high school team. Okay. Um, so there was some questions about are we changing, you know, sort of the universal approach to algebra one in eighth grade. And the answer is no. Um, we're not planning on going to, I don't know if it was 50% of the kids took it years ago, um, we are looking at that threshold. That is something okay. that we have had beginning conversations. Part of that work that the math curriculum team um, is going to be working on, that we're, we're, we're looking at all the data points and we're definitely looking of, we want to make sure the kids are ready for the rigor. Sure. Our Algebra 1 course looks different than it looked. Uh, the, the, as you know, the standards changed in 2017. Um, and, and frankly, our percentage of kids going on to AP calculus is 178% improved since 2013. So we do know that kids, many of the kids that may have not followed through are following through. One of the big areas that we have made a change is the pathways to make sure that we have access of everyone who wants to get to calculus really should be able to. As far as whether eighth grade is the right year for it, Jeffrey, that's still a question that we're asking too. Um, we definitely have that group that's ready for it. Um, and, and certainly we'll look at the threshold. We'll continue to look at that. And the calculus that they get to, is that AB or BC? So yeah, I believe in this it's AB. Um, okay. I could get the data points on BC for sure. And I, I know that I talked with some, one parent who had not in this district, who had gone to Carnegie Mellon and the person there said, if you haven't done BC calculus, don't even bother applying, right? That there are certain, you know, 
in these high technical STEM fields that if you haven't gotten to BC, then you're not really a serious math student. They can, yeah, no, yeah, I, in the I, I quoted the fact that it went up 178 percent in the last right, six years, right. John. It, yeah, I mean, we we still have the BC class. It's it's yeah. well, well populated. I could but check those, the those data. But those students who are in in ninth grade in algebra starting in ninth grade are going to get to AB calculus yeah. unless they do Correct. something they a little double extra. Up. They right. could definitely. They'd have, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other point was that this some of the students in that high math class will be taking AB calculus one year and BC the next. Um, you know, having paid, written the check recently for those AP exams, I kind of wonder how that, what that looks like, right, from the student perspective, right? So do they go ahead and pay the $100 for the a AB exam, even though they're expecting to take the BC exam the next year, and then the AB exam will be essentially thrown out because right. it won't matter to any of the colleges, right? It, there's a certain number of of credits you get, and what does it look like for the school if a bunch of students are enrolled in the AP, AB calculus class and don't take the exam because, hey, I know I'm going to take well, it. Well, that, and I don't have that answer, um, yeah. but we need to look into that. I, I've written that down as a question. Okay. I do know that the state now, as part of our accountability, tracks how many kids are enrolled in higher level courses. They don't track whether we take the test or not. Yeah. But uh, how many, yeah, the part, classes, how yeah. many, yeah, so they look at how much of our percentage of mm. students are in high-level math and high, they, that's part of our accountability now, but they don't actually, as of right now, they're not tracking whether you take the AP test or not. Okay, thank you. But I'll look into that for sure. Thank you for raising those points. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so I want to just take a minute as we close out the meeting to um, thank Dr. Coram and Mr. Bobbin for their service. I know we were talking before the meeting started that it's been about two and a half years almost for Mr. Wow. Bobbin. Um, I, I thought it was four, no. <laughs> um, so it's been, uh, actually we, Dr. Doherty was right. I thought it was three and a half, um, not two and a half. So, but we really appreciate the service and um, I think Chuck said earlier quite articulately, um, you know, some of your contributions to the board. So just want to especially give an opportunity to make, say anything if you want to. <laughs> so I, yeah, just on here briefly, but I've certainly enjoyed uh, discussing with you and also the opportunities to partake in the, the METCO rally and the, the Reading Institute, some perspectives on things that in my day job I don't usually get and I didn't feel like I was, you know, necessarily invited to some of the, I mean, I don't know, it was just something I couldn't quite justify taking the time out of my regular day to go do something unless I was on this, the school committee and felt that that was therefore, you know, something of a responsibility there to, to be more informed on some of these issues. So I thank you for letting me serve with you for this short time. It's wonderful to have you. I, you. I did. Yeah. Good to meet the governor. Well, I, I want to say three quick thank yous, two points and two gifts. Can you tell and I'm out. I promise. <laughs> for now. Well, see me later. Just thank you to the voters for um, giving me the opportunity to serve the community. Um, thank you to my family and thank you to the committee. Three people from the committee that aren't here tonight Ms. Borowski, uh, Dr. Nyan, and Dr. Vandenacker. Um, Ms. Borowski, in particular, was extremely patient with me as a new member of this committee in a very difficult year when <coughs> we were facing budget cuts and. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of questions, and she was very, very helpful in answering them. I wish she was here tonight, but hopefully she sees this. Um, two gifts. I'm going to do those next. Um, I was injured in the line of duty. <laughs> as a That's member. Right. So I'm going to give to uh, our chairperson the band -aids. some antibacterial, latex-free, gluten-free bandages with emojis. <laughs> They're for all ages, yeah. and that will protect all future committee members from yeah. such injuries. <laughs> Um, and the second is to um, the winner of the following challenge. So I have a challenge. Massachusetts Association of School Committee 2019 calendar here. I will leave this if the town manager will permit me at the town hall for the first elected school committee <coughs> member in 2019 to take the oath of office. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, Laura Jem, hopefully, if you're listening or seeing this, hopefully you'll be kind enough to help me with this. Otherwise, just send them to me. <laughs> happy to, to, you claim your prize. I, I haven't written any yet, and it's got all kinds of helpful information for new school committee members. Um, two quick comments, and then this is the mic drop. I'm out. Um, first, just thinking about school committee, um, two things that 
for me, just I take away from the experience, one is just the importance of and the difficulty of what everybody here does. There's people put a lot of time that you don't see. Um, everybody that I have served with on school committee really spends an enormous amount of effort um, to get a very, very difficult job right. Um, for me, the two things uh, that I found most challenging is the public oversight role of the committee. Um, that honestly, you unfortunately, you run out of other people's money before you run out of good ideas on how to spend it, and so you have to make difficult choices. We don't spend money, town meeting does that, but we allocate a lot of it, and that's hard to do. And the, and the last second point that leads to is constructive dissent. And if there's one thing that I would want for this committee and for this town is that we continue to view dissent as a productive and constructive exercise, and that we listen to people we don't agree with as um, continuously learn from other people, uh, but mostly when I disagree with them. So I want to thank people on this committee and people in the community for letting me know how they feel. I hope I've been constructive in expressing my views, and, and I'll continue to do whatever I can to help this committee uh, as a non-member. So thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a final motion? Four carries this one, right? <laughs> yes, it does. I will make a motion to adjourn. Okay. I will second it. Mr. Coram, second it. All those in favor? <laughs> Four? <laughs> Ab opposed? Abstained? <laughs> uh, don't Four want it to end. <laughs> Four to one. This All right. That's, that was your signature. There you go. <laughs> All right. I thank you, sir.